Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's such an honor to be asked to moderate this forum on behalf of the Nebraska Cattlemen, the Independent Cattlemen of Nebraska, and the Nebraska Farm Bureau. On behalf of those organizations, I want to welcome all of you who are attending the, here today and appreciate your making the effort to do so. Sandhill folks are rugged individuals and we don't shy away from the cold. But in classic Nebraska weather, the temperature was about 45 degrees variation from last night to today. So much nicer tonight. I'm happy that that's the case. Before we begin, I'd like to ask everyone to stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to remind everybody in the audience to turn your cell phones to vibrate before we get started because that's one of the important things in, uh, in trying when we work in the legislature. To do this. <laughs> I want to thank you all for attending, and I want to recognize Rosemary Anderson, who was the individual who put the forum together and who worked so hard here to see that it is a success. Rosemary, you're out here somewhere. <laughs> and I'd also like to recognize the leadership of Farm Bureau and the Independent Cattlemen and the Nebraska Cattlemen who are here tonight. I'm going to introduce those folks. Uh, Jeff Rudloff, who's the new uh, president of the Nebraska Cattlemen. Back here. Way back in the corner. <laughs> Doug McCracken, who's the uh, second vice president, or the first vice president. <laughs> Barb Cooksley, who's the next, uh, the next office. <laughs> Pete, Pete McClammon, who took over from Michael Kelsey. He's the executive vice president. Field, who is the lobbyist for uh, Nebraska Cattlemen. And for the Nebraska Farm Bureau, Steve Nelson from Minden, who is the president. <laughs> Sherry Vinton is second vice president. Sherry. <laughs> Jessica Coulterman over here. And Jay, and Jay Ferris. Jay's out here in the corner. Uh, and I'd also like to recognize KNOP, KSTZ, the Sheridan County Journal Star, the World Herald, Nebraska Educational Television, and the Grant County News for covering the forum tonight. Now to our candidates, I want to say welcome to Hyannis. Everyone likes to brag about their hometown. In 2013, Hyannis Public Schools were state runner-up in, in six-man football and D2 state championships for play production. We do well in academics, and we placed number one in reading comprehension of the 249 school districts about five years ago. So I'm proud of our school here in our community. Our school system is excellent. Our students are well-respected when they venture into the world. The biggest problem we have is that we like to have them all come back, and that is impossible here and in most of rural Nebraska, where a declining population has become a grave opponent to the continuance of our way of life. Hyannis was named for the Massachusetts community, as were other Grant County communities. You can see the port down here on the east end of town where the lake is. It, it was the first community to organize its ranchers into a stock growers association, which became part of the Nebraska Cattlemen and is the home community of the independent cattlemen of Nebraska. Hyannis is a community of 180 people, and it sits on the deepest part of the Ogallala Aquifer, with over a thousand feet of saturated thickness beneath our feet. Some years ago, we were the epicenter of an effort to mine water for export to the city of Denver. Now that really got people's attention. Wild Horse Hill, southwest of Ashby, is a nationally recognized landmark and the largest and highest hill in the entire Sand Hills. Livestock production is the primary industry of the community and the surrounding area with the developing tourism industry. My primary duty here tonight is to be the tough guy, and my first duty is to give both the audience and the candidates some instructions on how the forum will be conducted. Jessica, Jessica Coulterman and Pete McClement over here are taking questions. There are papers you can write down your questions. What they're going to try to do is amalgamate those questions so that, uh, you know, we don't have five questions about water. We'll have one. <clears throat> First of all, each candidate will have two minutes to uh, give an introduction about themselves, what they've done and some of their objectives. And after that, we'll move into questions, and the candidates will have 90 seconds to answer each question. These two girls in front are our timers. So after, in the beginning session, after you've had a minute and a half to, to, to produce, they'll give you a 30-second flag. 
and then you have you need to wrap it up. And my job, of course, is the tough guy, so if you don't do it, I'm going to have to do that job myself, and that could get kind of ugly. <laughs> We're allotting two hours for the debate. If there aren't enough questions for the full two hours, we'll close early. Since there are seven candidates, we'll take the last 15 minutes for each candidate to give a closing statement of two minutes each. After the debate, if individuals have individual questions for the senators and the senators are willing to stay, um, I'm sure that they will take your questions, but for the audience, remember these guys have come a long way and they probably have a long way to go home, either tonight or tomorrow. Finally, I want to say to the candidates how much I appreciate the effort that you have made to come to Hyannis. Many times people in western Nebraska feel that they are left out of the discussion and are forgotten. By coming here, you demonstrate to us that western Nebraska isn't just, is just as important as Omaha and the east. Having just finished my own campaign, I know how exhausting the work can be, and I have nothing but respect for each of you. So with that said, we'll go ahead and begin, and I think we'll start with Senator Carlson. Thank you, Al. And I want to uh, take this opportunity to thank Rosemary. I know how these things work, and, and you're not here tonight other than... Uh, Somebody called you and told you to be here several times, and, and we really appreciate that. Thanks to the Nebraska Cattlemen and the Independent Cattlemen and Farm Bureau for sponsoring this. Margo and I feel like it's a privilege to be a part of this group tonight. We have three grown children, four grandchildren. We're very proud of our whole family. I grew up on a farm north of Holdridge, worked for my dad on the farm, uh, graduated from high school, went on to college, played football and baseball, earned my college degree, master's degree, went another three years for a PhD because I wanted to teach and coach in college. Had that opportunity to go to, to uh, Wisconsin State University there for seven years and then to a private school in Indiana for three years, taught, coached football and baseball. We moved back to Holdridge and I went into small business for 30 years. And that was a great experience, a great learning experience. I know what it's like to make payroll. I know what it's like to uh, meet expenses. I know what it's like to have an employee who works for me, and their livelihood depends on my production. Small business is the economic engine that runs Nebraska. Most of you here tonight are a part of small business. Very, very important to the success in our state. I uh, went on to uh, be in the state legislature for seven years, the past seven years. I've been chair of the Ag Committee for four years, and now I'm chair of the Natural Resources Committee. Water is an issue that we deal with in natural resources. A sustainable water uh, policy is absolutely vital for the state of Nebraska. I understand that. I understand that you would like to have a lowering of property tax and income tax. Margo and I have visited all 93 counties. We've met a lot of wonderful people. And uh, most of your views agree with us. We appreciate this opportunity to be with you tonight. I do want to be your governor, and I'll tell you that in closing. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us here tonight. Um, my name is Bo McCoy. Uh, I grew up a fourth generation rancher on our family's cow-calf operation west of Binkelman on the Colorado-Nebraska border. And today my family and I own and operate a construction company in the Elkhorn and uh, West Omaha, Western Douglas County area where I've represented uh, District 39 in the legislature. This will be my sixth year. My wife, Sean, and I have four kids, and uh, I've really enjoyed being involved in small business um, and growing up in agriculture. You know, the first uh, business that my brothers and I uh, started was a custom haying operation that put our way through college. And I, I know, the, know the value of hard work. It's been part of who I am in the last five years in the legislature. And I've fought very hard to lower taxes, control uh, spending, uh, work on providing the best quality jobs and bringing our young people back uh, to rural Nebraska uh, and to provide the best quality education. And those have been the hallmarks of, of what I've worked on in the legislature and why I want uh, to be the next governor of our, of our state. Uh, thank you again for having us tonight. Thanks 
to every one of you for coming out tonight and embracing your responsibility as citizens in a democracy to inform yourselves before you vote. Um, I grew up on a hog and cattle farm in Platte County. Uh, my family has operated continuously for over a century. Uh, I remember when I was 18, driving a tractor, pulling a hay rack, um, and thinking to myself about what I wanted to, to do with my life. And I thought, you know, if I could just figure out a way to make a living, fighting for the things I believe in, well, that would be the most rewarding life. And I've been blessed with that opportunity. I spent the last 36 years at the Center for Rural Affairs fighting to create a future for the small town and rural way of life, working to strengthen family farms and ranches, support small business development, and revitalize our small towns. Um, along the way, of the last 17 years, I was the director. I managed a multi-million dollar budget. Every year I had to make choices about what good things we wouldn't do because we couldn't afford them. Um, during that time I was director, we helped 10,000 small businesses across rural Nebraska with loans, training, and help putting together business plans. We helped young people get started in farming and ranching. And we got new legislation passed to create tax incentives and financing for small businesses for beginning farmers and ranchers. I also spent 18 years on the University of Nebraska Board of Regents. Uh, my district in northeast Nebraska uh, was composed of mostly small towns and rural areas. Uh, one of my proudest achievements was uh, I spearheaded creation of the Rural Futures Institute to get the university working on creating a future in a small town in rural America. Rural Nebraska. Mm -hmm. um, we just hired our first director, Chuck Schroeder, the former CEO of Nebraska Cattle and Beef Association, so I'm really excited about where that's going. Um, I live in Lyons, a small town of 850 people in northeast Nebraska with my wife Kate. We have two sons, Anton and Peter, both students at the University of Nebraska, and we belong to Bethany Lutheran Church in Lyons. Great. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you very much, Rosemary, the uh, Nebraska Cattlemen and Farm Bureau, Independent Cattlemen, for sponsoring, and Senator for being our moderator tonight. A little bit about myself. My mom grew up on a farm about 10 miles south of Nebraska City. My dad's dad was a carpenter in Nebraska City. Now, my dad ruined every piece of wood he ever touched, so he couldn't stay in the family business. So he left him. Nebraska City went to Omaha, put himself through Creighton University, sometimes working three jobs to do so. Eventually, he started what is today called TD Ameritrade. He and three partners kicked in $12,500, money he didn't have, he had to get from friends and family, and started building the business. I came back to work for the firm in 1993. I started off on the phones, giving out stock quotes and trade confirmations, and worked my way up to be the chief operating officer. Along the way, meeting my wonderful wife, Suzanne, and having three wonderful children. When I started the company, we had about 150 people, and today there's over 2,000 people in Nebraska and 6,000 people across the country. After uh, 2005, I left that job and started running for the U.S. Senate against Ben Nelson, unsuccessfully. But I stayed involved in politics, was a national committee man for the Republican Party here in Nebraska, traveling the state and building the party. I also started my own firm and was involved in a variety of charitable and political options. And last fall, I put my hat in the ring to run for governor. And I've been traveling the state on my Aga manufacturing tour. And people have said to me, well, why are you running for governor? And frankly, it's pretty simple. I love Nebraska. We have a great state with great people. And we still live the American dream here. People still get up in the morning, want to work hard, take care of their families, get involved in their communities. But it doesn't happen by accident. It only happens if we have conservative leadership that makes it possible. And for the last 15 years, we've had that leadership with Governor Heinemann, Governor Jones. And as your next governor, I will work to continue to make Nebraska a great place to work, live, and raise your families. But I can't do it alone. Well, that was 10 seconds? Sorry, I thought that was a 30 second. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you to the sponsoring organizations and Senator, thank you for moderating and, and thank you all for coming out tonight in the cold. Um, um, I am, live in Omaha and married to my wife Leslie and we have two children. My son is in the Navy in Guam and my daughter is a CPA in Atlanta, Georgia and an Auburn grad. 
and so she won't be listening in tonight. Um, I, I grew up, uh, went to junior high in Gordon, and went to high school in Gearing, and uh, then went on to the University of Nebraska. Uh, following college uh, there, both with, I achieved an accounting degree and a law degree, I went to work for Congressman Hal Dobb on the Ways and Means Committee in Washington, D.C., during the Tax Reform Act of 86, which was the largest federal tax reform we've ever had. And, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, following that, worked in the Reagan administration as the assistant, to assistant to the commissioner of the IRS to actually implement that tax reform. Um, so I have a long tax policy and tax background. I later went, went on to become a tax attorney in Washington, D.C., working for an international firm, uh, opened up the first American law office in East Berlin, after the wall came down, and uh, worked in East Berlin, I worked in Japan extensively, and have a tax and international dispute resolution background. Uh, Sixteen years ago, it was time to come home. Our kids were getting ready for junior high and high school, and this is where they needed to be. So we had an opportunity to come back to Omaha, and for the last 16 years I've been in Omaha, running uh, the last six years the Deloitte accounting firm, which is the largest accounting firm in the state. Um, I've spent a lot of time dealing with the issues is that, that actually we have a lot of tough decisions over the next few years to make in this state. Issues related to taxes, issues related to economic development, um, issues related to free trade. And uh, it is those issues that brought me into this campaign. I think I have a, both a national, state, and global experience uh, to be very effective. And uh, thank you for allowing me to be part of this tonight. I too would like to thank the sponsoring organizations. I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Ricketts for not actually hitting me with his left hand while he was <laughs> introducing himself. I was uh, born and raised in Nebraska, uh, born in a town, believe it or not, smaller than Hyannis, uh, 200 people, Nickerson, Nebraska, and lived, uh, went uh, to college or school K through 12 and K through college in Nebraska. The only time I ever left our state was to serve us in the, uh, my service in the United States Navy. I was a search and rescue swimmer uh, during the late 80s, early 90s. I did two combat tours during the Persian Gulf War. That certainly taught me a lot of life lessons at a very young age. It also taught me to fight back for what is right. And as a state senator, I'd like to think I've been doing that. Previous to that, as a city councilman in Fremont, I'd like to think I've been doing that. And I can't tell you how proud I was when I walked in tonight to see petitions around this room touting voter ID. Something that was near and dear to me, something that I have as a sponsored bill in the legislature right now, something that I went to the mat on, went to the floor on, and I fought for in the legislature, and we came up 30 votes, or three votes short. That bill's back, and it's going to have trouble, so I'm happy to see that we're here signing that, and if you get a chance, please sign that that uh, petition tonight and help me get this bill passed in the legislature. I've never been one to stand still. I've never been one to, to worry all the time about what somebody else is saying. When Obamacare came forward, I was right there front and center pushing back on it in the state legislature. I'll continue to do that. When the federal government tried to take our gun rights away, I fought back. I said, no, I said, let's do something. I put forward a bill in the legislature, sponsored it, and fought for it, and have talked to people all across the state, and I'll continue to fight for you and push back against our federal government as your next governor. Thank you. You probably know who's next. It's our state auditor, Mr. Avery. Oh, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Senator Davis. And thanks to all of you. Thanks for the sponsors, for all of you coming out this evening. Uh, a few moments ago, as I was greeting many of you, someone said, so who do you hope wins the football game tonight? And I said, who's playing? <laughs> I had to admit, I've been so immersed in my campaign, I've lost track of all the college football playoffs. So anyway, I heard that Auburn's playing, but let's go Auburn. But anyway, uh, a little bit about myself, my background. In, in 2001, I was sworn in as a state senator representing a district in Lincoln, and had the privilege of serving you, the people of the state of Nebraska, for six years in the intercampal. And during that six-year period, you might recall, back in the early 2000s, the economy took a, kind of a downturn. And the state budget went into a deficit situation, which we cannot have. 
And uh, there was enormous pressure put on the state senators to raise taxes in order to fill that deficit hole. And all my colleagues all around me voted yes for that tax bill, the tax increase, and I said no. Because the people in Nebraska have to tighten their belts to make do during tough times, we can too. We can tighten our belts. And I'm very proud of that no vote on that big tax increase bill that went, back, went through in the year 2003. And all the promises were made about how that was going to be a temporary tax increase, no way. Those taxes are still in effect. We need to get those rolled back. After six years in unicameral, I was elected as your state's auditor. And for eight years, I've served as a state auditor. And I've worked tirelessly to dig and dig and dig again into these state agencies and expose millions of dollars of waste, fraud, and abuse in our government operations. We've got people in prison today because of our audit work. And that's where they ought to be. Because they're going to steal from you and me. They've got to be held to an account and make sure they don't do that. And because of our work, we save taxpayers millions of dollars. I think I'm about out of time. We'll say more about all this later. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, gentlemen. I really, as I said to you earlier, I'm so uh, thrilled that you're here in Hyannis, and I know the people here are too. We really appreciate that. So now we'll go into the questions. And again, remember, just to remind you, it's a minute and a half, and the, the girls will flag you at the minute, and then you'll have 30 seconds to wrap it up. So the first question is, should the state reduce property taxes? If so, as governor, how would you proceed with leading this effort? And we'll start with, with uh, <laughs> Mr. Foley. Well, absolutely, we should, we should lower property taxes. We hear it over and over and over again. You know, there should be a balance as to how the state and the local governments derive the revenue, a balance between income taxes, sales taxes, and property taxes. That balance has gotten out of whack. The property taxes have gotten too high, and we've got to address that problem. There is a, there is a program called the Property Tax Credit Program. The difficulty, the challenge is in funding that program. In order to fund that program, you've got to make room in your budget. And that's where my experience as state auditor comes in. We've been able to dig into these state agencies and find those areas where we can trim back expenditures, to find those people who are abusing the process, or in some cases even stealing our money. We're not spending it wisely. That's what we've got to do. We can talk all day long about tax reform, tax reduction, and so forth. We all want it. Everybody on this panel is going to say they want tax reduction. We all do. How are we going to get there? The only way to get there is to control spending. And now, my eighth year estate auditor, I know where we can find those savings. I will dig for those as you go. Thank you. Just a reminder to you, gentlemen, that you probably need to hold the mic closer to your mouth. Um, uh, Senator Jansen. Thank you. Absolutely, uh, it needs to be lowered. In fact, just this morning, you could go to uh, my website, uh, votejansen.com, two S's in Jansen. I just came out with a seven-part uh, tax reduction plan. It deals with property tax uh, on ag land. It will lower the current value from 75% down to 65%. Uh, the, property, the fund that uh, the auditor was just speaking of, I would increase that by 30%. I came up with meaningful ways to pay for it, uh, places in government where we're spending too much, where there are inefficiencies, and we need to shed light on that with routine audits, and we need to look at a budgeting committee every year instead of just when it's a crisis. Uh, that plan's out there. It's also on Facebook. But again, I'll encourage you to go to votejansen.com and take a look at my new tax plan that just came out this morning uh, that will significantly reduce income tax, sales tax, and for me, uh, not for me, but for military people and Social Security retirement income, that will be exempted under my seven-part plan, and there's a plan to pay for that. Thank you. Mr. Sloan? Uh, absolutely, we need to reduce property tax, and I don't think anybody on this podium will disagree with that. Uh, we are one of the highest property tax states in the country. Um, but let me take it a little bit further. Um, we have a three-legged stool in Nebraska that doesn't work, sales taxes, income taxes, and property taxes. And we continually, from a political standpoint, just move money from one bucket to another. And there are times that that's appropriate. But fundamentally, as a state, what we're going to have to ultimately do is have an adult conversation 
about how much we spend and how much we tax. And so we need a more fundamental reform. Um, we need to reduce property taxes right now, but we need to have a bigger debate. Is ultimately, if we're going to reduce taxes in this state, we're going to have to keep the level of government spending at a much lower rate than the rise in the economic activity in the state and the revenues that come in. And so the reason I'm running is we need a longer than one year political sense of what we're going to do. We need a five to ten year plan of how we're going to move this state forward fundamentally on spending and taxes. And it's got to be a real reform. We need to lower property taxes, but we need real reform in the entire tax system. We need economic development one end of the state to the other if we're ever going to lower taxes in the state. Mr. Ricketts? The short answer, of course, is yes, we need to reduce property taxes. I was talking to uh, John Woodison tonight, and he was telling me a lot of folks have just gotten their tax bills in the mail and seeing increases of 20 or $30 an acre. That's a huge shock. And we need overall tax reform in general. There's a couple of ways we can, there's a variety of ways we can address property tax. One, put a governor on how fast valuations can rise, put more money in directly to property tax relief. But we do need to have tax modernization at a broader level, including income tax, sales tax, and most importantly, reducing state spending. And this is where my experience as being a chief operating officer is going to be really important. I've run a large organization that has maintained cost controls, and I've managed large budgets and made tough decisions. And we can leverage technology, such as we've done at Ameritrade, to be able to reduce our spending at the state government and still provide services and leave money left over to invest wisely in the things we want to invest in. And we at the state can work across the state, from one end to the other, with all the constituencies, the Farm Bureau, the cattlemen, the chambers, the industry groups, to craft that plan. That's what you do in business. You work collaboratively with your partners at all levels to craft the best solution. That's how I would approach tax reform and property tax relief as part of a big package. And that's the experience I bring to the table and people will accomplish that. Thank you. Mr. Asper. Well, as most of the farmers and ranchers in this room know, property tax is the single most burdensome tax in the state of Nebraska. And it's my top priority for, for tax relief. Now, there are three keys. One is we have to stop pushing spending down from the state level onto local government off of income taxes and on to property taxes. Because every time that happens, state elected officials claim they provide a tax relief, but what they really did was push it down. They push the pain down to local government and the property taxpayer. So one of the first things is we don't get rid of the income tax. We don't focus on cutting the top rate on income taxes. Because if we do that, ultimately it's going to be like it always is. The pain gets pushed down and we get more burden on local real estate tax. Second is we have to find new sources of revenue. That's one of the reasons I'm such a big advocate of wind development. You know, the average wind turbine that goes up over <coughs> its life will generate $100,000 of local taxes. And that's $100,000 for every wind turbine that can be used for property tax relief. And lastly, we need to work at improving efficiency in local government, and the state needs to be a partner. For example, the state needs to work with our school districts to help our school districts work together. For example, share superintendents, share teachers for low enrollment courses, um, provide our local schools some incentives and some help working together so we can keep our local schools, but help them work together to improve efficiency and reduce the tax burden. And Senator McCoy? Well, property taxes must be reduced in Nebraska. Today I uh, rolled out my tax plan for Nebraska that I intend on acting on, not just this session in the legislature, but what I would do going forward as governor. The first part of that plan is to inject another $85 million into the property tax credit relief fund. You know, that currently gets funded at $115 million. That's the best and surest way I know to immediately give back dollars to the taxpayers that deserve them the most. And that goes for those in agriculture and outside agriculture. The second bill that I'm going to introduce on Wednesday, the first day of session, is to reduce ag land valuations for taxation purposes from 75% to 65%. But to phase that in over three years, which gives us time to plan for that, 
not only in state government, but at the local level and with our school districts. I think those are two key ways that I intend to act on property tax relief. You know, that's been a hallmark of what I've worked on in the legislature, not just property tax relief that we continue to prioritize, but also income tax relief. You know, my income tax bill that I prioritized two years ago just went into effect on January 1st that makes a difference for each and every Nebraskan. Today, it's property taxes. That is our biggest challenge that we face. Senator Carlson. Like everyone else here, property taxes are too high. Uh, I've got my bill on our farmland, and, and of course, I don't like that increase at all. I think that uh, one of the real deciding factors in property tax is that too much of K-12 education is paid for with property tax. Across the state, it's about 55%. Uh, I'd like to see it go down to about 40%, but realistically, if we took it down to 50, uh, that would give some relief for property tax. Now, you also have to look at uh, what's the outcome of that. If we don't cut our spending in education, then uh, that obligation goes over to sales and income tax. I think that's still possible to work, but we've got to have a growing economy. We've got to have a significant increase in private sector jobs in order to make this kind of thing work. And it's one thing, uh, I, as we've gone across the state in the 93 counties and talked to people, uh, most people, they want property tax relief, but I really didn't hear a lot of uh, uh, commanding that we cut education dollars. Uh, most of us understand the importance of education, but we've got to be more efficient in the way that we provide our education, uh, but we want quality education, an opportunity for every child in Nebraska to earn a quality education. But uh, we have just got to do things more efficiently, but the big thing is, let's do what we can to have that uh, economic increase, and it needs to be at least 50% in rural Nebraska. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, that's where much of the emphasis needs to be. Thank you. The next question is a water question. No, yes. Please share your thoughts on funding for water issues. For example, we just had a $10 occupation tax per acre on our irrigated pivot. Should the funding for water projects be local or statewide? And we'll start with Mr. Asper. Um, I'm not sure what the answer is to funding water projects. Um, it's a complicated question, but there's a need. We're going to have to come up with a combination of ways to pay for water conservation projects, water storage projects, and frankly, research to make better use of water. I mean, in the, in the farm, irrigated farming areas, one of the most important things we can do um, is research to help us learn ways to farm um, and produce good yields with less water. Overall, I think Nebraska has a good framework for water policy. First of all, our water is one of our absolutely most important resources. And we have an obligation to use that in a way that sustains it, not only for our neighbors, but for our children and grandchildren. Because I believe we all have a moral obligation to leave the land and water to the next generation as well as we receive it. And that is Nebraska policy. Nebraska policy says water is to be managed on a sustained yield basis, meaning used in a way that enables the next generation to continue using it the same way. But we've done one good thing, and that's we've turned implementation of that over to the local natural resource districts, so management and implementation of that is responsive to local concerns. I think that's good policy. Senator Carlson? Senator Davis and I were both part of the Water Sustainability Task Force, which met 20-some days from the uh, middle of July until the first part of December. That was my priority bill from last session. It's so absolutely critically important in the state of Nebraska that we develop a policy on water that makes us sustainable, which means that on average, you have to have average because you've got wet and dry years, but on average, we're not using any more water than what our supply gives us. And if we're using more water than what our supply gives us, we've got two choices. We either increase our supply or we cut our use. It probably ends up being a little bit of both. We have an opportunity to increase our supply. I don't think I have enough time here to talk about how we increase our supply, but we can do that. But we've got to educate people across the state of the importance of water sustainability. And I think most of you here tonight, you understand that. We sit on the greatest freshwater 
uh, supply in the United States, and 66% of it lies under the state of Nebraska. We've got to manage that in such a way that for generations to come, we have water. And if we do that, and when we do that, agriculture is guaranteed profitability for generations into the future, and it's absolutely very important. When we educate people on the importance of that, then I think how do we pay for it becomes a, a secondary problem. Uh, but it should be paid for by everyone in the state. However, if we have a given project in an area that helps an area towards sustainability, there's going to be local participation, probably about 40% of that cost. So we will have some trial balloons this next session on funding, and we'll see where we go with it. Mr. Sloan? I remember right, the question was, should it be state funded or local funded? Um, no, I think I've got it. Um, the answer is, there's going to be a handful of, of very serious questions that, that we need to address, but address in the context of a real opportunity the state has. For most of my life, the driver in the economy has been technology. Um, for the next 20 years, the drivers in the national economy are going to be water, energy, and agriculture. Um, Nebraska is poised uh, because of the access to water, because of the strong agricultural community, and because of what is going to, at least going to be probably stable energy prices from natural gas, to really make strides. Those are going to be the foundations of our economic development. So when we talk about water policy, when we're talking about these tough issues that are critical to economic development, there needs to be a state policy and local control. And this is where the rub comes, is can you have state funding and still have local control? I believe we can. And so I think on core issues that really go to the economic development of Nebraska, there needs to be substantial state funding. I'm not saying it will be all state funding, but I think the state needs to make an investment. Agriculture, water, energy. Thank you. Well, first off, I'm happy that we're talking about a resource we still have and that we can still manage this resource. Uh, I, I'm an opponent, or excuse me, a proponent of uh, the Attorney General uh, vigorously enforcing our interstate compact on water, and he's done so, and I hope he continues to do so. When we talk about funding, you know, when you go back east, uh, people probably think the user should be the one paying. I think it should be a statewide issue. The small town I referenced that I grew up in was a farming town. I'm one generation removed from a farm. And that town was built on the farm economy. In large part, irrigated crops. And that's and that money turned over and over and over in this small town. And it allowed for that small town, Hyannis, and all the small towns in between that I saw today that I'll see very late tonight on the way back through to sustain themselves. So if you're asking about funding, I'm sure there's going to be several ideas out there on how to do it, but I'll say as the governor, my idea is that it's a Nebraska issue and not just a user issue. Thank you. Mr. Ricketts. Thank you. Water is a big, complicated issue. I was at the Farm Bureau Convention a couple of weeks ago, and the folks from the eastern end of the state were talking about flood control and dams, and the folks from the western part were saying, hey, we need more money for sustainable water options. That shows the diversity of the issues, from groundwater to surface water, east to west, recreational users, irrigators, and this is the lifeblood of our state. We are the largest irrigated state. We have the, large, you know, the most, uh, the Senate pivot manufacturers are located here in Nebraska. We're the epicenter. And it, this is where the governor plays a unique role. Because we have a unique system of NRDs and local control that's very important to all of us. And the governor needs to step in to bring together all these diverse constituencies from across the state, east and west, all the people I just talked about, recreational, irrigators. Get them all to the table and then craft a solution that everyone may have to give in something, they may not all love, but they may like. And then you can take that to this, the state senate, work on the senators to go along with it, and then you can craft legislation. And this is again where the governor has to demonstrate leadership, and that's the type of leadership I will demonstrate as your governor, and the type where I will bring my business experience to bring together a constituents from all across the state to work on solving the problem. 
problem that we all have an interest in. And with regard to who pays, again, it's going to be a shared problem that we're all going to solve together. Thank you very much. Mr. Foley. Thank you. I want to begin by just uh, thanking Senator Davis and Senator Tom Carlson for their service in the Water Task Force. You guys did a great job, a great service to people in Nebraska, and I know you put a lot of hours into that work. And you've elevated this issue to where it needs to be. It is a statewide issue to answer the question directly. It is a statewide issue. We're going to have to solve this as a people of the state. You know, we have tremendous water resources. Isn't it remarkable that we now have over 9 million acres of farmland that are irrigated? What a tremendous advance on this. We have over 110,000 registered wells with our Department of Natural Resources. Again, a tremendous advance. 40, 50 years ago, we had fewer than 1,000 registered wells. Now we've got 110,000 wells. So we have this great resource, the, the Ogallala Aquifer. Again, we're the envy of the nation. States not very far from here have to drill halfway to China to find water. We've got it right below us. It's, it's going to be a question of managing that resource, defending our agricultural interests to make sure that those interests always remain forefront in our state. That's the backbone of our state. And it's going to be a Nebraska solution to this issue. Yes, there are local dimensions to it. Of course there are. But ultimately, it's going to be a Nebraska solution. I'm not real wild about the taxes you guys propose. I think we can get there by cost savings in state government. But other than that, I thank you for your work. And uh, Senator McCoy. You know, water is a huge issue, as it's been said for our state. You know, I, I think back on the original well that was hand dug beside the sod house that uh, my great grandparents raised eight kids in and that I was raised in. You know, water is, is very scarce where our cattle ranch is on a tributary of the Republican River. But as it's been said, our climate's very diverse uh, from west to east. And what we do in agriculture and farming and ranching. Uh, is, is a very noble endeavor. We're feeding the world. And we've got to protect agriculture. You have to look no further than the state of Oklahoma or the state of Texas or even the state of Kansas to really realize what happens when the Oglala Aquifer levels drop and how negatively that can impact the rural communities in those states. We don't want that to happen here. It's a state compact with Colorado and Kansas that we have in Nebraska. It is a state responsibility. And I believe it's the job of the governor. And this isn't how I intend to lead as governor. I've served four years, my first four years on the National Resources Committee. You've got to dig in, roll up your sleeves, and find solutions that are based statewide that still have that local control that we all appreciate with our natural resource districts. Thank you, gentlemen. <clears throat> Just to remind you, we, you can submit your questions over here to the left. Because of the number of questions, we probably won't get through everything, but we'll do us the part we'll do a good job of trying. Third question, uh, last year, LB 405 and 406 were introduced to remove many of the sales tax exemptions on ag inputs such as seed, fertilizer, and fuel. Do you support this legislation, or would you support similar legislation in the future? We'll start with Mr. Ricketts. Thank you. Taxing inputs is bad tax policy. You want to tax end products. When you tax inputs, whether it's going to be ag producers or manufacturers, you make our producers and our manufacturers less competitive. I've been on my ag and manufacturing tour, traveling all across the state for the last four months, and it's a consistent message when I've talked to either producers or manufacturers on how detrimental taxing inputs would be. And that's just not the policy we want to produce. If we want to look at growing the sales tax, we want to look to industries where perhaps we're getting an unfair advantage or disadvantage in an industry. But it should be an end consumer who's paying that because that's the way sales tax are supposed to work. So if we're looking for overall tax modernization going forward, we don't want to have the tax of inputs be a part of that program. Thanks. Mr. Foley? I was very disappointed to see that tax bill introduced last year. I was certainly not a supporter of that LB405 or 406. That was the wrong way to go. Uh, and I, I think the problem there was that the bill was not properly vetted through, uh, through the best, you know, the different communities within our state, the agricultural communities and so forth, who would have immediately alerted the governor and, and those who carried the bill that was the wrong approach. We do need tax reform in the state. 
It's not just a question of property taxes. It's not just a question of income taxes. So we've got to cover all of our taxes. We are a high tax state. It's just that simple. We're a high tax state. And if we're going to grow our economy, we've got to address that issue. And as I said earlier, we can talk all day long about lowering taxes. The only way to get there is to control spending. And that's what I've been all about the past eight years of my career in government, is working as your auditor, digging into these agencies and rooting out these wastes, these inefficiencies, this corruption that's there. And corruption is not too strong a word. Just a few weeks ago, I had a team of auditors go out to Scott's Bluff and interview uh, a lady who was embezzling money from wards of the state. She had set herself up as the legal guardian for over 600 Nebraskans and was stealing their money. Again, these are the kind of things that we've got to dig into if we're going to get meaningful tax reform in Nebraska. Thank you. Senator McCoy? Well, LB 405 and 406 were, were my bills uh, that I introduced at the, at the request of Governor Heineman. And I'll tell you why I did that. Both of those bills uh, were killed in committee. I made the motion to kill them. But I won't back down from a tough discussion. And taxes are the toughest discussion that we can have in our state. And you've got to be willing, as governor, and you've got to be willing, as a state senator, to stand up and say, you know what, we got to start a discussion. And we can have tax reform. We can cut taxes. And for the first time in a generation, we're having the, the most serious conversation about tax reform that we've ever had. You know, Part of what I introduced today is adding a sales tax exemption for ag parts and labor. Because we've got to be competitive with our surrounding states. You can get rid of income taxes. We can make strides in cutting property taxes. But you've got to be willing to start a discussion and to deal with tough issues. That's what I've done in the legislature. That's why I'm the one standing up here with a bill I prioritized two years ago that cut income taxes. That's important. It's important for property tax reduction and it's important for income tax reduction because the states that have grown the most in the United States are ones that have greatly reduced income taxes so that you can spur job growth and economic development. Senator Jansen. Well, I agree that uh, 405 and 406 uh, should not have been introduced last year. I don't think they were properly vetted. Uh, I wish we would have started the discussion uh, on, a, on a different note rather than taxing inputs. And as far as where I stand, it, it's I'm on the record, I'm on the Revenue Committee. Uh, I voted to kill that bill and subsequently was killed in committee. Uh, so we could go back to the drawing board. Uh, we went across the state as a member of the Tax Modernization Committee. Uh, five different stops. I was disappointed in what we found out because I knew what we'd find out. We'd need lower property taxes. What I was disappointed in is when we got back to Lincoln, it seemed like everything was okay. We had a, the structure was just fine. I was not happy with the report. I did not sign on to that report. And there, henceforth, I put forward my own plan that we talked about earlier that reduces uh, ag land valuation from 75 to 65% and lowers and actually increases what we're given to property tax relief by 30%. And again, that plan's on votejansen.com and I invite you to look at it. And, and as we move forward, um, I hope that we come forward with policies that really just don't pick winners and losers and shift it from one person to the other. I call that uh, rearranging the seating chart on the Titanic. And I think that's what the Tax Modernization Committee came up with. And hopefully we can get meaningful tax relief. That's what I proposed as a state senator. And that's what I'll push for as your next governor. Thank you. Mr. Hesper. Well, I uh, actively worked uh, to kill that bill uh, to expand as, as a leader of the Center for Rural Affairs uh, that would have added sales tax to farm inputs and equipment. Um, and I think it speaks to the problem of putting such a big emphasis on eliminating or reducing income taxes because inevitably when we do that, we shift the pain down we shift it to other taxpayers. In this case, it would have been farmers and ranchers and manufacturers who really took a beating, sick people um, and college students. Um, it, was, it was a bad bill and need to be killed. I think, so I think in the long run, I think we have to be leery about radio schemes to get rid of the income tax because somebody's going to pay, and very often it ends up being farmers and ranchers and other ordinary Nebraskans. Um, 
On the spending issue, I, I think we've got to come to grips with some things in Nebraska. You know, we've we've made some cuts in Nebraska, but sometimes we cut in the wrong places. We cut in the places where we need to be investing to enable us to, to be a more prosperous state and have lower taxes long term. So we cut mental health services. We don't provide much in the way of help to families with kids who have uh, learning disabilities, behavior problems. But you know what? We lead the nation in the percentage of our kids in prison. And we're second in the nation in the percentage of our kids uh, in foster care. And we've improved that a little bit, but we're still in the top ten. And so I think we need to invest in things that enable every Nebraskan to contribute to this state's prosperity and expect them to. Um, and if we start doing that in the long term, we're going to be, we're going to have tax relief. First of all, I'll say that I admire Senator McCoy for standing up and admitting those were his two bills. And I don't have a problem with a tough discussion on taxes. But I can tell you this, when, when I heard about those two bills, I started talking to farmers and people in manufacturing uh, in my district, first of all. Uh, obviously, that was going to be a, a terrible thing for agriculture and for manufacturing. And it was brought out as a, a revenue neutral bill. Well, if something is revenue neutral, that means that the parties involved in that bill that are affected by it, some of them get a big tax break, others get a big tax increase if it's revenue neutral. And that's, that would have been the outcome of that. And of course, in talking uh, to people in ag and in manufacturing, uh, had that gone through and it became law, uh, we'd have had a big exit from the state of Nebraska with manufacturing. They wouldn't have a choice, and I understand that. Uh, but I, I would say this, the system we have at the legislature, where at a hearing, the public, you, become the second house, worked wonderfully on those two bills. In two days of testimony, there were three positive testimonies for the bills and 58 negative. That helped the committee. That didn't make it a difficult decision for the committee or the governor on that. The discussion of taxes is a good thing. And uh, we simply need to move forward with a tax policy that's both fair and competitive. And those two characteristics are very difficult to come by, but they have to be there. And we cannot, we cannot kill our number one industry, agriculture, in the process of tax reform. Mr. Spahn? Uh, this is a subject that I may know a little bit about. Um, I've been a tax attorney and accountant for 30 years, but more importantly, um, my views on, on taxation, reforming taxation, really stem from my time working with and in the Reagan administration in 86. Um, as you remember, um, tax rates at that time, federal tax rates, were 50% at the top rate. Uh, Ronald Reagan reduced those to 28%. He did it very simply. Um, he got us out of the business of tax shelters. Um, you know, tax shelter farming. Um, what he did was take out all the special interest deductions and all the special interest credits and simply tax people on their economic income. It wasn't a difficult concept and got the rate from 50 to 28. Whether it's sales tax or income tax, I'm a flat taxer. Um, I want to tax people solely on their economic income and get rid of all the rest of the stuff in the codes. Similarly, on the sales tax, I would agree uh, we should not tax inputs. Uh, we should tax sales tax at one level of gross receipts. Um, I've been there, I've done it at a federal level. Um, that's exactly where I want to take this uh, at a state level. And I think I've got the experience to do it. Thank you. The next question is, <clears throat> would you support or oppose efforts to restrict or regulate certain practices related to animal care on farms and ranches, such as issues related to animal housing or medical treatment? And we'll start with uh, Auditor Foley. Thank you. I'm very aware of the, this organization called HSUS, which thinks they know more about care of animals than, than people who actually do the work. And I think that that, that organization needs to be watched, to be monitored, and make sure they do not uh, infiltrate our ag sector. I think that's a very dangerous organization. They've got an agenda that's not pro-ag, it's not pro-livestock, and I'm very concerned about that. And as your next governor, you can, be, you can bet that I'll be watching for any efforts that they make to try to infiltrate our ag sector. Thank you. Mr. Sloan? That organization has a, has a larger agenda, uh, which is 
a non-animal protein agenda. Um, so I give very little credence to that agenda. Uh, the current governor, my friend Governor Heineman, um, had some very strong words for that organization. Uh, they'll get no less from me. Um, I'm very comfortable with both traditional and modern farming methods. And uh, one of the things we need to do as a state and as a community is make sure people know where their food comes from. Um, I'm afraid even in this state, most people don't know where their food comes from. And uh, at all levels, we need to do a better job of making sure people understand uh, where that food comes from that they eat every night. And as governor, um, I need to be a bit of a cheerleader around that and make sure people understand these processes um, so organizations like that don't get a foothold uh, in this state. Thank you. Senator Carlson. This whole thing is an unnecessary uh, discussion. Uh, Humane Society in the United States has no place in Nebraska. Uh, thanks to Farm Bureau, I've crossed the state a couple of times with the governor talking about that organization and what they try to do. They're bad news. None of you mistreat your assets. It's ridiculous. We don't have that problem in Nebraska. And we don't need an agenda that says that we need to stop the killing of animals for food. It's the wrong thing. That organization gets all kinds of people with their TV ads to join them for $20 a month. They take in over $130 million a year. Very, very little of it is spent on rescuing animals. Most of it is spent on a political agenda to take you out of business. And we can't have that in Nebraska. I will stand against HSUS. If they try to come into Nebraska, they will not be successful. But we've got to be in this thing together because they're a real threat. And they probably aren't going to stop. But we will stop them. Senator Jensen. Thank you. Yeah, this organization would, would have you believe that it's puppy dogs and kitty cats that they're talking about. And, and I've seen the commercials late at night. They're on more and more. And I was proud to be part of the movement in the state legislature that basically they came there with a lobbying group. And one of the local lobbyists signed on with them. And all of a sudden, uh, state senators rose up and said, look, we're done. We're done speaking with you. And guess what? They let go of that organization. That organization is no longer down actively lobbying in the state legislature. And organizations like this, and even the federal government, start with these small issues. I call it the puppy dogs and kitty cats. They'll start with gun control the same way. They'll start with a little issue, says, well, that's not a big deal. Don't worry, we're not gonna take your guns. Well, that's their agenda. That's what they wanna do. It happens over and over. You see it with Obamacare, and the reason I oppose that so much. It starts when they say, well, we wanna take care of the people that are uninsured. Well, I talked to a gentleman tonight that since Obamacare happened, not only is it sure it's gotten worse, well, it's probably better. You don't have it now. And that's what's happened when you, when you quit watching organizations like this, uh, not just the HSUS, but also the United States federal government. Because they'll come after you, and they have an agenda, and they always try to do it sugar-coated early on. Like I said, it'll start with the puppy dogs and kitty cats. So be wary of them. And as governor, I'll fight back not only on all of those issues, but particularly when it comes to uh, the animals and, and what we do with them. So, thank you. Mr. Hesseberg. Well, I strongly oppose efforts to regulate livestock production practices. Um, in, in, and I've done a lot of work with family farmers and ranchers over my career, and from my perspective, we need more options, not regulations that take options away. So I've been a big supporter agricultural research, agricultural market development, I gave farmers and ranchers more options, more ways to make a living, more alternatives for how they go about producing and marketing their product, because I think that's the way. Uh, we can create more opportunities for beginning farmers and ranchers and keep our communities viable. Senator McGoin. While we're very way of life, in Nebraska is under assault in agriculture and livestock production from groups not just like Humane Society in the United States, uh, but from other groups as well. And I had the opportunity to travel the country as a national officer of the Council of State Governments, which represents all 7,800 state legislators across the country. And you know, it's a sad tale that you hear, unfortunately, in so many states that have given quarter 
to these types of organizations. And you know how it happens? It happens because you have folks in those states who don't appreciate what our way of life is and the noble endeavor it is to feed the world. And that we, the last thing we would do is to harm our resources, not only natural resources, but our livestock resources, and that it's our way of life. That's what they're after. And as governor, you have to be very strong and diligent to give no quarter. And you have to have the ability to have a unicameral, in our case, that believes the same. Not every state has done that. And those are the states where agriculture is declining. And Mr. Ricketts. Thank you. My grandpa was a farmer. I've got cousins in farming. I've been traveling across the state and talked to farmers and ranchers all across the state. In fact, this morning I was having breakfast uh, with Homer, Darla, and Chad Buell, who are the 2012 Leopold Award winners for their conservation work on their ranch. And many of you are in agriculture. And you understand that farmers and ranchers were the first conservationists. You know, if you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. You want to pass it on to the next generation. And that's what we're about here in Nebraska. We don't need outside groups like HSUS coming in who've never owned any livestock telling us what to do. And the governor has taken the exact right stance to take a hard line with him. And as your next governor, I will take a hard line with him too. I will be a strong advocate for agriculture because we know how to handle our business. We don't need outside groups telling us what to do. And we actually have been the conservationists long before this became a green fad. Thank you. Next question. Around here there is a joke that western Nebraska, eastern Wyoming, and eastern Colorado should form a state because they share the same issues and are all far from the centers of political influence. How would you handle this issue as governor? We'll start with Senator Jansen. Well, that's not a very easy one to start with. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Well, I don't think we're going to be giving away... Uh, the, this part of the state, I certainly wouldn't want to. In fact, uh, I've been in this, uh, I've been a candidate for governor since February, and I've been traveling the state. I've got a two-year-old pickup that has 74,000 miles on it, and I can tell you I've been through uh, this part of the state more often than not, uh, thanks to some good friends in Oglala that let me uh, uh, shack up there once in a while with them. And, you know, I was, I was proud when I showed up out there one morning, I'm a newspaper, and we're talking about what I believe in, and we're going through you know, the way I push back on the issues that I've talked about already, Obamacare, gun rights, voter ID, uh, all these issues kept coming forward. And he, in the next morning, the next day's paper, said, I think Charlie Jansen was born in western Nebraska. He should have been from western Nebraska. Well, I was born in Fremont and raised in Nickerson, but it felt like western Nebraska, because when you grow up in a family that has one car and your dad takes it to work all day, you're stuck in that town. So uh, certainly, this is an asset uh, to the, the entire state. Being out here, uh, really, I, it's really enjoyable out here, and that's why I've been out here so much. So certainly, uh, this is a big part of the state, and as governor, you better get used to seeing me out here, because I'm going to be out here an awful lot, and if you got good hunting ground out here, talk to me after this. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Carlson. As we've traveled around... Uh, particularly in the western part of the state, we do hear this kind of attitude that uh, you don't care about us back there. Nobody cares about us, uh, Lincoln and Omaha and back in the eastern part. I understand that feeling. Part of it is the news that you get, and, and uh, whatever I could do as governor to see that you get news from Nebraska would be a good thing out here because we need to keep you attached. The other thing is, too many times over the years, I really think in our economic development, and we have a lot of things that we can do to market the state of Nebraska to those outside the state to come here and be a part of it because we have a wonderful, wonderful way of life. We don't market it well enough. We need to market that more. And that marketing needs to be to the benefit of rural Nebraska. And as governor, I will see to it that when we have an economic development project, we have an economic development bill, roughly 50% of the people in the state live in a rural setting. We should have 50% of the dollars go for rural Nebraska. We need to help you. We need to bring you in. We need to make you feel good about where you are. And part of that comes from a responsibility of the governor and state government to see that that happens. I will do that. Mr. Ricketts. 
that, you know, that question really is a great question because it goes to the diversity of our state. You know, when you're at the Missouri River heading west, for every 25 miles you go, you lose an inch of rain. And you have an urban center there. And you have all these diverse interests across the state. We talked about someone with water. And this is where the governor plays a key role. In fact, the only person who can play this role is the governor, to bring the state together, all the constituencies, east and west, rural and urban. And that is the role of the governor. And that's the experience I had as the chief operating officer in Ameritrade, because you have diverse interests within a company. You have customer service interests. You have people who are involved in technology. You have marketing. You have finance. To make a company work, you have to bring all those different diverse talents together and get them to function as a team. That's the experience I have as governor. That's the skills and experience I, or as uh, the chief operating officer of Ameritrade, and that's the skills and experience I want to bring to the job of governor. And that's what I will do as your governor. Thank you very much. Mr. Sloan. My feelings on this are a little bit stronger than most. Um, when I was growing up out here in the Panhandle, uh, there was a governor by the name of Exit. And as I remember, we had bumper stickers that said, Ax, X, and save the Panhandle. Um, <laughs> governors, uh, at least before Dave Heineman, didn't have a great track record of, of being out here, uh, fundamentally. And uh, for me, it's, it's very personal. It's the reason I'm in the race. Um, I, I'm from here. Uh, my wife will tell you this is where my heart is. Uh, this is where I want to end up when it's all over. And she will tell you that. And so what I'm trying to get you to do is at least move her 50 miles east um, and get her started on the way. Um, but it's very important. Um, the real question in this race is what's going to be here for our kids in the next generation? And that is the fundamental question of this race. If we go about politics as usual, Omaha's going to do great. I live in Omaha. I'm a member of Exarban. They will do great. The question is, what are we going to do here? And do we have an economic and a tax plan for the entire state? And do we have somebody that will think about the panhandle every day? Um, I have a very special interest in this place. And I'm very happy to be here. And I will be a different kind of governor for Western Nebraska. Mr. Hasselbrook. Uh, well, Westerners that feel like they're often misunderstood and ignored by the powers that be in eastern Nebraska are right. You are often misunderstood and ignored by the powers that be in eastern Nebraska. And one of the things I'd like to do as governor is establish um, a capital for a day in different parts of the state, in the Panhandle, the Sand Hills. Where the governor comes out, sets up the office for a a day, brings out some state agency heads, so uh, people come out to see the issues that are facing people in this part of the state, and people in this part of the state come in and talk to agency heads and the governor and others that they need to talk to. But the other problem this part of the state faces is the very problem that, that Senator Davis referred to, it was the challenge of a declining population in small towns and rural communities. And I spent 36 years fighting to create a future in small town and rural America in Nebraska. And uh, a big part of that, a big part of that is that we need to focus on small business development, entrepreneurship, beginning farmers. And that's what I've tried to do. And that's why I will. Mr. Foley. Thank you. You know, when I came into the legislature in 2001, representing a district in Lincoln, uh, the freshman senators are often are paired up with another senator to share an office. And I reached out to Phil Erdman from Bayard, Nebraska. And Phil and I became great friends. And it was remarkable how our values were so similar. Phil and I want the same things for our family. In Lincoln, we might earn our daily bread differently from the way that people earn their daily bread in Hyannis, Nebraska. But our values are the same. And as your governor, I want to share those values, those common Nebraska values of decency, of hard work, of our remarkable work ethic that we have in Nebraska, and of our defense of the unborn child, which I championed when I was in the legislature. Because I know it's a value that means a lot to me as a Lincolnite, but also means a whole lot to you out here in the western part of the state. Those are shared values that I wanted to emphasize. And as a state senator, I've done it as your state auditor, and I will do it as your governor. And Senator McCoy. 
you know, it is hard for communities in western Kansas, eastern Colorado, and western Nebraska, eastern Wyoming, uh, to feel like they're part of, of a complete part of their respective states. You know, I think part of that's because so many times the way of life is very different than what it is in metropolitan areas. You know, that's certainly the case for, for the atmosphere that I grew up in. You know, some of my closest uh, friendships in the legislature have been with people like Tom Hansen from North Platte and Deb Fisher from Valentine, Cap Dirks from Ewing. Because that's the way of life I grew up in. You know, I, I uh, run and own and operate a small business today where we uh, create jobs and make a payroll. But you have to understand how difficult it is in a rural community, whether, wherever it is in the country, but especially in this area of the country, and know what that means, um, and be willing to stick up for those values, not just in Lincoln, but in any state capital and across the country. I think that's a hallmark of the unicameral, frankly, and one that we ought to be very proud of, because there are only 49 of us, and the buck stops on every one of our desks. And that means we have to look out for what's best for urban and for rural Nebraska. That's what I intend to do as the next governor. The next question is, as governor, how are you going to improve the quality of rural internet? I'm going to start with Mr. Ricketts. <laughs> Thanks. So the internet is obviously something that my family is very familiar with because that's one of the things that we leverage to be able to grow our company. And there is a tremendous opportunity in using the internet to be able to reach out to the rest of the world. So I probably understand more than most folks what power lies in the internet and how important it is. And infrastructure is one of the things that we as a state can really leverage to be able to provide for our citizens to be successful. So as governor, I'm going to be taking how we supply rural internet to our communities very, very seriously and working with the folks in the communities to figure out how we can do a better job of that. And that's one of the situations where I think that when you're going to solve a problem, you try to solve it by working with the people that are closest to the problem. And so I would form an advisory group to be able to work my way around the state, similar to what I've done with my ag advisory group on this campaign, to sit down with folks all across the state, sit down, hear the issues, talk to the folks at the Public Service Commission, talk to the folks, uh, you know, talk to our elected officials and the federal delegation, and start figuring out how we pull people together to figure out what are the steps we can do to make real definite changes of where the issues are the most. I mean, I, I was just uh, in uh, uh, Burwell and Brewster today, and you can't even get very good cell service there. So we do have places where we have to improve upon our infrastructure here in the state to make a better quality of life for all of our citizens. Thanks. Um, Mr. Foley? <laughs> yes, thank you. When I was in the legislature, I dug into this question of the Universal Service Fund, which is a fund that we all pay as part of our landline phone bills, and it helps to subsidize rural phone service. That's, that's the backbone of communications in Nebraska. We've got to maintain that Nebraska Universal Service Fund and apply it in a way that's fair to all Nebraskans. And I've, I've met with a number of the rural telephone company representatives and we've worked closely with them and they're supporting me in this campaign because they know that I will be a defender of the Universal Service Fund, which is so important to western Nebraska to make sure that you do have good communications out here because communications are the backbones of your, of your small businesses. More and more of our transactions are internet driven. And we've got to make sure that we've got good, strong service, a plentiful service in, in every nook and cranny of our state. And, and I'm committed to that as you're going. Senator McCoy. You know, I serve on the Transportation and Telecommunications Committee, and we just had a public hearing on the Universal Service Fund in Scotts Bluff um, about two months ago. You know, and I was struck very much by the testimony during that hearing of a young lady from Thedford, or uh, grew up on a ranch just outside Thedford, who talked about a business that she started uh, at, at their family's ranch, uh, selling a service, a product, online. And I think that's very exciting for Nebraska, to realize that we can harness technology, we can harness the internet in rural Nebraska in a way that's never been possible before, to grow jobs, in our rural communities. 
I think that's the future of our state. That's how we keep our young people uh, in rural communities, is by finding ways to grow jobs uh, using the Internet. Uh, you know, in, in many, and in many other ways, but part of it is using that universal service fund that we all pay into to make sure that access is as good in every community as it is in Omaha or Lincoln. You know, one of the things a lot of people aren't aware of in Nebraska, you know, internet speed today is better in many parts of Scotts Bluff than it is in most of Omaha. That is really exciting. That tells you that we're doing some great things. We can build on that and continue to grow jobs in rural Nebraska. I think that's an important part of what I intend to work on as the next governor. Senator Jensen. Well, that's an interesting question because I was trying to uh, text somebody on the way up here and ask them that very question, but I had no service all the way up Highway 92. <laughs> so as a member of the Transportation and Telecommunications Committee, I think I want to change the name of 92 to No Service uh, Highway. Uh, it, it certainly is an issue, and I, I along with uh, the Senator there, uh, served on the Telecommunications Committee, and we did the interim study uh, talking about you know, how we can allow connectivity to happen in uh, the more rural parts of the state. And when you talk about creating small businesses, uh, my business that I started uh, was also largely leveraged uh, on internet connectivity running a staffing agency that works nationwide. Uh, now it's out of Fremont, but we, we utilize the internet. If we didn't have that, uh, we most likely would not be in business today. So how do we get people to come back to small towns? How do we keep our children in small towns? It's through technology. And we need to work with uh, not only our community colleges, I think Scotts Bluff has great connectivity because in large part because of Western Nebraska Community College. Uh, we can work with our high schools, community colleges to ensure uh, that we can keep our children here, and uh, certainly, um, I, as your governor, would advocate for that, and hopefully I could uh, send you an email and let you know about that. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Sloan. That's a great question, and if you want to have a 5 or 10 or 15 year vision for this part of the country, it's a core question. When I announced a few weeks ago in Geary, um, I laid out a three-point plan, the first first piece of it was tax reform, which we've already covered, but the second piece was how do we get the University of Nebraska to touch each and every community in, the, in this state? How do we provide the same sort of education and research capabilities in every single community in this state? Because it's absolutely possible, but we've got to have the interconnection, internet connections to make it work. And secondly, how do we bring businesses to this part of the state? The fact of the matter is that more and more of our economy is driven by internet businesses. Now, the one thing I would say is as we look at economic development and we look at investing in infrastructure, two things. One, every region of the state is a little bit different. There are some regions in this state where a highway is more important than laying cable. There are some regions out here where laying, laying, laying fiber is very, very important. But it needs to be part of a plan. It just can't be sort of a political, here's what we're going to do. It has to be part of a vision. What are we going to do with this? What businesses are we going to bring in? Because ultimately, the best way to develop internet connectivity here is the free market, is to bring some companies in who drive the volume that make that capital investment worthwhile. And so there's a real opportunity to do that. And I'll give you one quick example. If you go down to the I-80 corridor in Sydney and Kimball in that area, we're two hours from Denver International Airport. And I'm done. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, those are the rules. Um, Mr. Hassel. Well, we badly need better internet and cell phone service in many parts of rural Nebraska. And on internet service, I've noticed something. One of the things I've noticed is that in the areas where we have local Nebraska telephone companies, the internet service is better than in areas where we have big out-of-state companies providing the local service. And there's, and it, and it, the deal is this, that when you have a local company that is invested entirely in Nebraska, it's their priority and they invest here. When you're a, a national or international uh, telephone communications company, you've got better places to invest than rural Nebraska. And I think there's a way to fix that. I think we need to empower the Public Service Commission in Nebraska authority to regulate terms and service of wireless, uh, quality of wireless service as well as internet service. 
And so that we say to some of those larger firms, look, if you want to suck money out of here, then you need to provide decent service. And Senator Carlson? In answer to an earlier question, I said that when I'm governor, one of the things that we're going to do as far as economic development is concerned, because roughly 50% of the people live in a, in a rural setting, is that we should have 50% of those dollars go toward rural Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, and then we look at internet, we look at, uh, at phone service, cell phone service. Uh, if we don't improve that, what I just said are just a bunch of hollow words. We've got to have both. And uh, as your governor, I would uh, really work in every way to have that come true. It's a little bit like if we all of a sudden told the Nebraska football team, next year we're going to save some money and you can't have helmets. Well, it wouldn't work. And so we tell you to do things in rural Nebraska to bring people in here and so we can stop our downward cycle on population. Uh, but you don't have phone service and you don't have internet. It's an impossible situation. It's got to all work together as your governor. On that, uh, as I was starting our construction and building our construction business, you know, I think we've got to do a really good job, a better job than what we've done so far, in really targeting what are those area of high needs when it comes to jobs, not just in rural Nebraska, but across the entire state. Because I think that's the answer to where we go from here. And, and that's jobs in tourism, that's jobs in manufacturing, that's jobs in agriculture, and that's how I think we keep our rural communities vibrant. That's how we keep that mass exodus of a lot of our young people that leave every year, whether it's for education opportunities or for job opportunities, because we can keep them here. You know, we have a great quality of life and a work ethic that is second to none. And I think we all know and appreciate that and love that about Nebraska. But it means we've got to work very hard about being very targeted in how we grow jobs in rural Nebraska and digging down, identifying what it is that's going to take to make a difference uh, in the industries where we're really short and we're going to be shorter with a lot of the baby boomers that are going to retire in the next decade. Because if we don't get a handle on that problem, it's going to be very difficult for us to continue to be competitive across the country in our state. That's what I intend to work on as governor. Senator Carlson. We look at tourism, and we've talked a lot tonight about tax reduction, and that's important. But there are some things that we need to be willing to invest in. And uh, tourism is one of those things. If we talk about tourism, and we don't put any dollars forward to promote it, we're not going anywhere. So we have to think about that. The other thing, I think that our school systems need to do a better job. I would like to see that every high school graduate comes out of high school with a marketable skill. And we've got a lot of jobs available to those people if they have a marketable skill. So our high schools need to be encouraged to do a better job of preparing students in that regard. And, and if we did that, and we had a little bit more technology, perhaps, training in our high school systems, uh, we need to encourage graduates that have the ability to become entrepreneurs and start their own business, if there's some incentive for them to do that. We need to look at that as well. These things promote economic um, boom in rural Nebraska. And we have to do all of those things to get where we need to be and want to be uh, in rural Nebraska. And so again, as governor, those are going to be the kind of things that I focus on now. We talk about we've got to set aside some money for things like uh, economic development. Well, we've got to have a growing economy. That's the key to that. More private sector jobs, more people employed. We have the dollars coming in. We can do those good things that need to be done. Mr. Hasselberg. Well, we can create a, a bright future out here in rural Nebraska, but we've got to put a priority on the small businesses and on the family ranches and family farms that have always been the backbone of the rural economy. You know, we've done some things. I've written bills and got them passed um, that provide incentives to rent land to beginning farmers that provide a uh, tax break for selling land on contract to a beginning farmer, that provide a 20% investment tax, cre tax credit on a limited investment to a beginning farmer, a rancher, or a, a small business, uh, and other things. But 
When it comes to small business, or to, to family enterprise, we always put real tight limits on them. So for on our tax credit for beginning farmers and micro enterprise, we say that it's limited to $2 million for all the, all the beginning farmers and ranchers and all the small businesses in the state. But when it comes to tax incentives for big companies, spend $100 million a year, there's no limit. We, we never put a priority on small business development on family enterprise. So when I'm governor, that's going to change. We're going to put a priority. Small business and family enterprises are going to be an afterthought. It's going to be a priority. Mr. Foley? Thank you. <clears throat> At lunchtime today, I had the opportunity to visit with a member of the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And we were commiserating over the fact that many of our state parks are not being properly maintained. If we Nebraskans don't want to visit our state parks, what hope is there that we can attract tourists from other parts of the country to want to come to Nebraska and enjoy our parks. We've got to solve that problem. I know that's going to be a big discussion in the legislature this next year. And I hope they'll come up with a solution because we've got to address the problem of properly maintaining our state park system. On questions of economic development, business decisions are made on tax policy in many respects. We've got to have a more favorable tax climate in Nebraska so that businesses will want to expand here, will want to locate here, and what do we have to offer? We've got, we've got to offer is a remarkable work ethic among the people of Nebraska. We need to market that to companies and stress that this is a tremendous asset we have in Nebraska, the work ethic of our people. If we can market that and build a more favorable tax climate, we can do wonders for economic development in the state. Mr. Sloan. Well, this is, you know, this is not a simple question, but this is the issue of the day, uh, which is, how are we going to develop this state? And, and the reality is that we just have to make some conscious choices. We don't need to reduce taxes so rich people pay less tax. We need to reduce taxes so we do indeed provide businesses and business opportunities that come to our state throughout the state. We need to get that state income tax rate down to around 4% to be competitive. And the only way I can see we're going to get there is to go with a, a flatter, fairer tax to make sure that works. If we can bring businesses in, we have all the other advantages over the next 10 or 20 years. I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, the things that are going to drive the economy in the future are energy prices and water. And we are going to be very competitive as a state going forward. The other thing is, for the last 16 years, I've managed a very large company where the average age was 27. What this next generation wants is quality of life. And we have it. We need a governor that's going to brand this state as the best quality of life in the country, including the panhandle as part of that. That's, that's what I'm going to be about. Senator Jensen. Thank you. I'll, I'll tell you the uh, tourism part that I'm most concerned about right now is the tourism that happens outside of our state. I'm concerned with people that leave our state for six months and one day so they can find a more favorable tax climate. And that happens. They take their money, their resources, and they'll move to a Texas. They'll move to a Florida for six months and one day to escape the Nebraska taxes, high taxes. That's why in my seven-part tax plan, I proposed exempting Social Security income. And for my fellow veterans, exempting military retirement income and also lowering the overall income brackets and scaling them up over the years. That's a, good, that's a good start. It also helps keep people here. When you talk, uh, 25 years ago, I graduated high school. I can't imagine how disheartening it was when I'm sitting there in my cap and gown, and I'm sitting next to the guy next to me who was in a shop class with me, and the principal or the speaker gets up and says, I'm proud of the Logan View class of 89. Of 48 of you, 39 are going on to a four-year college. I looked at this guy who was going to a technical school, and oh gee, I'm just going off to fight for our country. I'm not included in that number. Proud to say that guy that right now, the shop class, is leading a fleet uh, for a waste management company. I came back, served my country, went to college, and started my own business. There are opportunities. They just need to be recognized. They need to be recognized at the high school level and the college level. Thank you. And Mr. Ricketts. Agriculture is the backbone of our state's economy. Agriculture and manufacturing. It's incredibly important 
that we continue to have a strong ag sector. I mean, if you think about this last recession, there's been no better place to weather than right here in Nebraska because agriculture has been so strong. And as governor, I'll be a strong advocate for agriculture. And one out of seven jobs in Omaha is directly tied to agriculture. That's how important agriculture is to our state. And so how do we develop our rural communities and make sure agriculture continues to be strong? Well, as governor, one of the things you do is help open up markets for our producers. 95% of the world's consumers lie outside of our borders. We need to go get them. You support value-added agriculture, like corn ethanol, to make sure that we capture more of the value in our commodities and provide more economic opportunities. You have common sense application of regu regulations so our producers have freedom to operate, create a strong rural economy, and then help our cities and our state brand themselves. We talked about it a little bit. You know, I was in Norfolk. They want to brand themselves the Oktoberfest capital of Nebraska because they got a lot of Germans. That's a great idea. Nobody else is doing it. Wilbur's got Czech Fest. They should have Oktoberfest. And when it comes to branding, that's what we did at Ameritrade. That's how we grew, is by branding ourselves in the online brokerage category. And that's the experience and skills that I want to bring to the table as governor to help brand Nebraska as a place people want to come to work and live. Thank you. And the next question, please share your thoughts on Nebraska taking the federal funding available for Medicaid expansion through the Affordable Care Act. We'll start with Mr. Sloan. Yeah, this, is, this is a fairly easy question. Um, you know, if, if I trusted Washington, uh, then uh, I, would, I would come up with a different answer, but I don't. Um, I don't think that the federal government will be there to continue to contribute uh, if we expand Medicaid uh, in, the, in the future, and all we are is signing on to a, to a much bigger obligation for some time to come. Um, we also have a, a government mess uh, with respect to Obamacare that's going to take a couple years to settle out. Um, I don't think it makes any sense at this point to expand Medicaid, um, given the current circumstances and the current administration in Washington. I just, I just can't go there. Mr. Hasbrook? Well, I would expand Medicaid uh, because by not expanding it, we have the worst of both worlds. Every one of us pays federal taxes to pay for the cost of expanding Medicaid so low-wage workers in California, in New York, and Illinois can get Medicaid coverage. But our people don't get it. Our low-wage workers don't get it, and they can't afford health insurance. So they do what they have to do. They go to the emergency room and get health care, and they can't pay for it. But it still costs the hospital. So what do they do? They pass it on to those of us who do have insurance. And so we pay a second time. We pay a tax, in effect, in the form of higher insurance premiums to make up for the uncompensated care that people who can afford insurance have to get at the emergency room. In 1986, President Reagan signed a bill that says that anybody goes to the emergency room and needs care can't be turned away. And as long as that's true, we're gonna, <laughs> people are going to get care. The question is how we're going to pay for it. I don't think it's a good deal for us to pay taxes to support Medicaid in other states and then pay higher insurance premiums to pay for it in our state. And Senator Jansen? I do not and did not uh, support the expansion of Medicaid. It was it came up last year during our legislative session. Uh, I was one of the members of the legislature that had to work together uh, to ensure that that bill did not pass through the chamber. They're coming back at it again this year. Um, I think it's a bad idea. It's an expansion of Obamacare in Nebraska. I did everything I could as a state senator to even stop Obamacare from starting here in the first place. Uh, we know what happened. That went up to the Supreme Court. That's out of our hands now but we can do what we can do right here, and that's to oppose the expansion of Medicaid uh, and all the evils that's going to come with it. And I'll tell you what's going to happen, uh, which we've already been discussed by other members. Uh, they're going to put that carrot out in front of you, and you're going to chase it. And they're going to say, we're going to fund it. We're going to fund it. Same thing happened with special education years ago. The federal government's not supporting, not kicking any money into special education now. But that was a federal program. It's going to keep going year after year. 
And before you know it, we are going to be the ones that are paying for Obamacare in the state of Nebraska. Uh, it was a bad idea when it came down. You see what the implementation of uh, Obamacare is right now. I've talked to people that were supporters of Obamacare, people that debated me. And when I sat next to this person at a local coffee shop, college kid, he opened his Blue Cross Blue Shield. He had a policy, single guy, young, policy, $200 a month, just under $200 a month. It went up to $405 a month. Does that mean I'm done, or are you just giving me more time? <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Riggins? I agree with the governor's position in an opposed expansion of Medicaid. And if you think about what's going on at the federal level, we're spending a dollar and borrowing 42 cents of that. That's not sustainable in the long term. And I think actually the federal government has actually started paying for special education at a 40% level is now down to 18%. And that is what is going to happen with this as well. The federal government is going to have to renege on their promises because they can't afford to keep all the promises they've made. You and I all know that. And that is why we cannot expand Medicaid. We're not the federal government. We can't print our own money like they can. And as the governor says, we here in Nebraska, we're in such good shape because we don't spend money we don't have. And that's why it's important that when we think about long term, where are we going to be as a state, not taking on the responsibility of paying for things that we're not going to be able to afford. I would rather see us think about how we're going to invest the money that's going to grow the state and be wise custodians of our money and avoid signing up for things that we're not going to be able to pay for down the road. Mr. Foley? Thank you. This whole question of Medicaid expansion, I always got to chuckle out of this. It's, it's almost though, though people don't realize we've had Medicaid expansion in the state for many, many years. I'm the only candidate running for governor who's actually served on the Appropriations Committee, which is the committee that writes the state budget. And we've seen the expansion of Medicaid, and it's very, very damaging. It's, it's growing. That, that slice of pie gets bigger and bigger every year. And it's forcing out education and other priorities of the state. So do we want to expand Medicaid even beyond what we've got it right now? No way. No way. As the auditor, I've audited the Medicaid program. I know how broken it is. We've got to fix that problem because we share the cost of this. It's not just a federal uh, program. It's a federal state program. And a lot of our state dollars get sucked into a broken Medicaid system. And my audits have shown that time and time again. And I'm not going to accept this promise from the Obama administration take this deal because I'll fund it 100% this year and 100% next year and then it'll whittle down over the years. I don't accept that offer. He can't keep that promise. We know he can't keep that promise and we're not going to accept that offer. Senator Carlson. I'll get right into why I'm opposed to uh, expanding a Medicare. And, uh, you know, government cannot do everything for everyone. This is something we can't afford. I was really uncomfortable when we even had to discuss that last session. But the federal government was going to give us 100 cents on the dollar to put these 54,000 people under coverage for the first three years. No Nebraska dollars. Some of the senators said that's free money. It's not free money. It's tax money. It's our money that went into Washington. It's still tax money. It's not free. In the fourth year, we were to pick up 10% of the cost. We're supposed to vote on something today that is going to, we're going to take 10% of the cost in four years. We don't even know what that is. And how much confidence do we have that by the fourth year the government won't say, well, we said 10%, but now we mean 12 or we mean 15%. How many of you think that the costs today are going to stay the same, so in the fourth year it's going to be the same? There's no way. I tried to think of an example. How can I tell people why I don't vote for this? I thought, if you want to go out and buy a new house, so you shop and you look and you find and you find the house you want to buy, and you go to the realtor and say, I want to buy this house, what's it cost? The realtor will say, I don't know. We don't do it that way anymore. But I have a contract. If you sign it today, you can move into that house, make no payments for three years. In the fourth year, we'll decide what the house is worth. We'll set your payment. Now, once we set it, you're going to make it for life and know that it's probably going to go up every year. And if in the fourth year you decide you wish you hadn't signed that contract in the first place, you're going to have a tough time getting out of it. If that's the way you'd buy a house, you're going to love Medicaid expansion. <laughs> Senator McCoy. You know what's very different about Nebraska than from Washington, D.C., is we have to balance budget. You know, I'd like to believe that even if it wasn't a constitutional obligation in Nebraska to balance the budget, that we'd do it anyway, because that's the way we do things in our state. 
It's not the way they do things in Washington. You know, the, the, the biggest and best job that I think the governor of our state has is to be the number one defender of our way of life. And you know, that starts with saying no to the federal government. It's our tax dollars. You've got to be willing to stand up and say, a one-size-fits-all approach that might work in some other state, heck, it might even work in some other conservative Republican state somewhere. And I love it when somebody throws back and says, well, you know, some governor in a Republican state, well, they've expanded Medicaid. Must be pretty good. Not for us. We all know we do things different in Nebraska because a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work. We have to balance the budget, and there's no way if we expand Medicaid that years down the road it isn't going to result in higher taxes and less dollars for education. It's impossible. And I intend to lead as governor and continue to say no to the federal government. It's not free money. Next question. Currently, farmers and ranchers pay an inequitable amount in property tax to support local schools. Additionally, with the current state aid formula, rural schools receive very little state support. As governor, what would you do to better balance the burden of funding local schools? We'll start with Senator Carlson. Well, as I've said earlier, certainly I believe that uh, property tax pays too much of K-12 education. And we need to back that off. It's got to be backed off. And then we have to answer the question, are we still going to spend the same money on schools? And if so, sales and income tax is going to pick up the difference. And the only way that works is if we have an improving economy. We've got a uh, significant increase in private sector jobs, and that's what we ought to work toward anyway. That's the way it ought to be. But uh, what do you do? We've got 250 school districts in the state, and now about half of them receive no state aid. In other words, property tax is paying everything in those for those 125 districts. But those districts, the people in those districts, at the same time are paying income taxes and sales taxes into the state that's being redistributed to other districts. It's not fair. It's not an easy solution. The Education Committee's got to continue to work at that. I know they had meetings throughout the state and really didn't come to a consensus. As governor, I certainly will try and look at how we can make this adjustment to cut back on what property tax pays for education and uh, balance it out better. Mr. Ricketts? Yeah, we've talked a little bit about tax reform and how important it is that we have property tax reform and making sure that we're balancing out sales, income, and property taxes. And so we've talked about some of those ideas with regard to putting a governor on how fast valuations can go up or putting more money directly into property tax relief. I think there's another issue with this question that comes up with regard to school aid. We've got 249 school districts, 149 are not getting school aid. And the ones that are, you're, you're getting some things that, okay, granted, I'm not in the legislature, so I don't understand all of how that school aid formula works. But if you look at what's going on, I travel the state, people tell me that it's just getting harder and harder to manage it. Districts that aren't getting it are saying it's coming later and later in the year, making it harder for them to plan. That the amount they get goes up and down, and they don't under, they find out till late, making it very difficult to plan their budgets. If you look what happened in Omaha, Omaha Public Schools, which I think has the largest proportion of non or of low-income kids, actually got less money with the, the new school aid formula. It's definitely an issue that we need to take on as part of overall tax reform, is how we're funding our schools in the school aid formula. And you know, I was visiting the Bullen schools today, and they actually don't really get school aid. They technically get it because they've got some option in students. But their, their question to me was, how are you going to help pay for schools? And that's definitely a question we're going to have to figure out if we're going to have a strong rural community. Senator McCoy? You know, it's a real challenge today to provide that, that good quality education that we all expect. You know, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that Governor Heineman, in his almost 10 years as governor, and in the five years that I've been involved in the legislature, that even when times were very tough, and it was very difficult to balance the budget. We prioritized education funding. You know, not every state did. A lot of states, the first place they ran to cut is education. And they short-circuited their future. You know, we're not going to do that in Nebraska. But it also means we have to look at things creatively. We have to figure out how can we best fund schools across the state. Because what works 
in western Nebraska isn't necessarily going to work in urban Nebraska, and vice versa. But it means you have to find a system that's equitable for everybody. As operations have, have gotten larger, I don't have to tell all of you, that you have fewer and fewer taxpayers that are sharing more and more of the burden uh, to pay for those good quality schools. You know, our, our current system was built on the fly, on the floor of the legislature. Sometimes that works, sometimes it's not so great. It needs improvement, but it means that we can't lose sight of funding education because those kids are the next leaders who will be sitting on a table like this 20 or 30 years from now. That I intend to keep in mind as the next governor. Mr. Hasbrook. Well, education is a priority, and, and um, as one who's worked to change the school aid formula, to make it more equitable to small schools in rural communities, I can tell you it's tough, because every proposal to change school aid, every legislator gets a printout of its impact on every school district in his or her district, and they vote accordingly. And every time we do a census, and rural Nebraska gets less representation, it gets harder and harder to fix it. I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, but we have to try to fix that to make it fair to small schools, to, to, to districts that may have a lot of property per student, but don't necessarily have a lot of income per student. And, and we also have to do some things to stop the gaming of the system, because you know, recently there's one uh, large metropolitan district that was gaming the system. They do a few things, like add a few minutes to the school day, and therefore, we're able to get a whole bunch more uh, school aid. We need to fix that for them in a way that's fair to small schools, but also in rural districts, but also stops gaming the system. Senator Jensen. I know what you can do. Uh, my local school district did that I went to high school is uh, to curb spending at school level was to put a bunch of farmers and ranchers on the school board. They got elected, and that seemed to work pretty good overall, because they were directly involved in that. And that that's a true story, by the way. Uh, you know, when you look at schools, and when we talk about funding education, well, of course that's important, but we've got to dig deeper into it. What are we getting? Just like we talk about anything else with our health care dollars or any other government program, what's the end result? And how do we look into that? In government, I want to look into every agency every year to find inefficiencies. Is that happening? See an example. I've got uh, two of my four children are in school. And I recall in high school, grade school, I would get books in the, in the inside cover. You'd pull out a thing and there was names on it from 10 years before that had that book. And you checked it back in the next year. My son comes home with a brand new book every year. So that's just an inefficiency that just is glaring to me. And where else, where else might we be missing efficiencies in education? Uh, certainly, I, I would like to see on the property tax side, and that's why I put forward my tax proposal today, a way to smooth the effect so we're not doing this one year valuations way up because we have $7 corn two years ago, and so everybody's valuation goes up, and so do your neighbors because somebody sold their property and you're not selling. And that needs to be looked at from the assessment value, and we need to, we need to take a good look at how we assess property in the state of Nebraska. Thank you. Mr. Foley? There is a billion dollars of our tax money that flows through the Nebraska school aid formula. And that formula is an absolute disgrace. There aren't five people in the state of Nebraska who can define for you the school aid formula. It's a mess. It makes Obamacare look like a simplistic formula. It's terrible. There's a professor at the university who took our school aid formula out of our statute books and he expressed it as an algebraic equation. It runs, I've seen it, it runs 99 pages. And there is gaming of that school aid formula. One of the areas where it's gamed is in the school lunch program. The, one of the factors in the school aid uh, formula is that you, you prove, you superintendents prove you have more impoverished students in your districts, you get more school aid. And how do you prove it? By signing kids up for the federal school lunch program. That's our measure of poverty. Probably the world's worst measure of poverty. It's not accurate. And I'm not trying to take lunches away from hungry kids. I get that. They need those lunches. But let's make sure that only the kids who are eligible for that program get in there because it's throwing off the whole school aid formula. We've got to start over from scratch and rewrite that formula. There's too much money at stake 
It's not fair to the Nebraska taxpayers who spend a billion dollars in school aid and not have it divvied up fairly. And Mr. Sloan? My father was the uh, school superintendent in Gordon when I was growing up. And the problem when your father is the school superintendent is when you get sent to the school superintendent's office and it's your father, uh, there's no Geneva rules of, of uh, warfare that apply. <laughs> um, we had lots of discussions as I was growing up, and my mother had a very simple theory that the great education starts with great, great teachers and great coaches. And he firmly believed that and still believes that. My mother was a teacher as well. Um, but as a superintendent, he, he needed to be able to budget in advance. He needed, in order to hire those teachers, he needed to have a stable base of, of what the revenues were going to be. What we have now just simply doesn't work, point one. Two, um, the education of students in Gordon or Hyannis is, is not an issue for Gordon or Hyannis. It's a state issue. Um, in addition to those students who stay, there's a number who leave, and they become executives all over. They become executives in Lincoln and Omaha, and I'm one of those. And, and many of my friends are the same. We're educating students all over the state that are going to be the game changers for this state for the next 20 years. That's a statewide issue. Um, I talked about reforming taxes and putting things on the table and having adult conversations. We need to have an adult conversation about education and our duty to these kids. And that's a state issue. And so if it takes opening up the whole debate and having an honest discussion about whether state funding needs to change because these kids are a resource of the state, um, I'm perfectly willing to do that. We're, uh, we're getting to uh, about the last couple of questions, I'm, and I'm going to put two of them together. I'm going to tell you you have a choice, which one you want to answer. <coughs> and then we'll deal with the last question. So one of the questions is, um, with the rapidly growing mountain lion population, in addition to wolves moving into the northern tier, as governor, would you take any action to allow farmers and ranchers to protect their livestock? And if so, what action would you take? And the second question is, uh, what do you believe is the root cause of White Clay, Pine Ridge Reservation, and alcohol issues? And as governors, what action, if any, would you take to address the issue? And you can address both or one of those two questions. We'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Foley. You know, there's been uh, a fair amount of the press in recent days about this whole mountain lion question. And I, I think it's just remarkable that the legislature is, is going to get deep into that issue and spend a lot of time on that issue, probably because of Senator Chambers' efforts to defend the mountain lions. But you know, we ought to come out here sometime and, and see the real world and see the, the struggles that uh, people have dealing with, with uh, wild animals and so forth. And, and I think if he did, he'd, he'd have a very different perspective on this. So I, I'm not troubled by the fact that hunters uh, kill animals, and that's, that's part of the, the sport of hunting and so forth. Uh, hunting is, is a tremendous uh, uh, endeavor for people to engage in. There's a great passion for hunting in the this, this state. It's about the country for that fact. And uh, I think that, that that right to fish and hunt and so forth ought to be protect, protected and expanded. And uh, I'm not going to worry too much about the mountain lions. <laughs> Mr. Sloan. <clears throat> um, number one to to shirk from the tough question, I'll take on Lakeley. Um, since I, I grew up there, um, there's been a lot of years and there's, there's been no answers. Um, and most of the solutions I've heard don't seem like they're going to solve the problem either. Um, and it is a problem. It's, it's a problem uh, both in terms of the people who live there and the people who are affected by it, but also in terms of economic development in the region. Um, and so we're going to have to come to some solutions. Um, I'm not sure curbing private enterprise is going to solve that problem because I think things just move to another location. Um, so I think we have to have a long-term vision of what we're going to do there uh, because it affects my part of Nebraska uh, very significantly. And it means in incorporating people into the community and coming up with new ideas and another generation and perhaps another generation that's not skewed by um, things that have gone on for years and years and years. So I'm not telling you I have a solution to it, but I won't duck it. Uh, like most issues, as a governor, I won't duck uh, local issues. Mr. Hasbrook. Well, I, I think farmers and ranchers have to have the right to protect livestock from attacks by 
or mountain lions or what have you. And, and I do support the hunting season on mountain lions. We're building a population. It's, um, it's legitimate to hunt. I'm a hunter. Um, I went hunting two days ago with my son. Some folks say I'm a better hunter than I am a hitter. Uh, there might be some truth in that, but uh, I support the hunting season on mountain lions. Senator Carlson. Carl. I'll uh, comment briefly, and then I'm going to have a vote on the mountain lion situation. Now, I don't think I'm wrong. Under current law, you can protect your livestock and you can protect your family uh, against mountain lions, so you can do that. But um, help us out here. We go back into the session, there's going to be some discussion on this whole mountain lion thing. How many of you would say, don't make any change, whatever? Well, we have the current permitting process where people can get a permit and then they have that auction where they can get that special permit for a mountain lion. If you don't think that ought to be changed, just say leave it as it is. All right, if you think there ought to be a change in uh, our, our mountain lion law in a more liberal fashion, raise your hand. How many of you think it ought to be restricted further? Raise your hand. Well, you're not really a whole lot of help. <laughs> That's what I'm going to end that tonight. Thanks for trying. <laughs> Senator McCoy. Well, I voted for the bill that allowed uh, Game of Parks to establish a hunting season uh, for mountain lions. And Senator Carlson's right. We do already have, as Nebraskans, the the, uh, the right to protect our property and ourselves um, from predators like mountain lion. I support the hunting season. You know, one of things I've one of the things that I've learned uh, now in serving with Senator Chambers is this: uh, he he is a fierce advocate for things that he believes in. But guess what? He's one of 49, and he is but one senator. And you know, he's been there a long time. He was gone for four years, and now he's back. But he has to, to pony up 25 votes to get something passed, the same as everybody else. And we've stopped him in the past, and we'll stop him again. I led the charge to keep the death penalty last year and forced Senator Chambers to file the first cloture motion he'd ever done in his career. So he's but one senator. Um, and this is just one example of a way that he'll try to, to hijack this session, but he won't be successful. Senator Jensen. When you talk about tourism, here's one way to increase tourism. Have people come to our state and hunt mountain lions. Uh, and that's a legitimate uh, way to develop tourism. Uh, just two weeks ago, I was out turkey hunting. And we weren't having much luck. And we sat there for a couple hours. We lit the crack of dawn. And we waited and waited. And this is great. You can see tracks everywhere. Then all of a sudden, with me, I hear a pop. Kind of scared acting it. And I looked back, and he killed a coyote. Well, now we knew why we weren't seeing any turkeys in the area. And those turkeys, I didn't pay to have them put there. They were, they're out there free-ranging. Now, when it's taken out of your livestock, uh, you should have an absolute right, and you do in Nebraska. And I, I too, voted for the bill to allow for the mountain lion uh, hunting season. Uh, and, and also, uh, what else? We had the, the, not the ground squirrels, but uh, prairie dogs. yes, prairie dogs. <laughs> So Senator Loudon actually got that passed, and he got his district moved to Gretna. So we kind of wondered if Gretna had a problem with all them over there, but today uh, they're doing fine. And, uh, and as your governor, you know, am I, am I done? Oh, see, see how? And, uh, and up on, on White Clay, uh, I certainly would work with the governor of South Dakota and say, hey, you've got to do something about this. It's the residents uh, of that uh, nation up there uh, deserve to have help from the state in which they reside, and I certainly wouldn't be in favor of uh, curbing uh, economic commerce in Nebraska, and, uh, but I would be actively working because there is a problem there. Thank you. And Mr. Ricketts. Well, I, if you think about it, right, mountain lions are just another resource that we have here in the state that we have to manage. And so having a hunting season is absolutely appropriate. And in fact, if you look what we did here, I applaud what the Game of Parts did. They allowed young Mr. Bruce, right, to pay 15 bucks, get in a lottery, and be able to take advantage of that. Season that opened up on January 1st. And then the gentleman from uh, Sioux City, or um, Des Moines, Iowa someplace, 
pay $13,500 for that in an auction. Now that goes to the game of parks. That's a great way to manage it. And of course, because they are predators, we do have to manage that population. So I think the game of parks is done exactly the right thing. Um, and if I can, I'll also try and touch upon the white clay issue. You know, the Sioux Nation is a sovereign nation. And if we're going to solve this problem, it's going to be working with them as well. But part of the solution has got to come from Sioux Nation. They've got to be partners in this and not just be blaming Nebraskans for the problems there. So I think there is an opportunity to work together to be able to address the issue. But it's going to have to be a cooperative issue between both parties. This will be the last question. Then after we finish with this question, the candidates will have two minutes apiece to uh, kind of make a closing statement to you. And then I'll kind of make a wrap up at the end. So. Uh, the last question then is, please share your position on issues pertaining to life, including abortion and the death penalty. And we'll start with uh, Mr. Ricketts. I believe life begins at conception and ends at natural death. So when I think about issues of life, that is how I look at protecting the unborn. That if you're treating the mother under the principle of double effect and the child dies, that's a tragedy. But that's the framework we ought to be thinking about, is making sure that we're doing medical treatments and protecting the child's life to the best extent we can. So that is the way I'm always going to vote, or the way I'm always going to act as governor in Nebraska. When it comes to the death penalty, I'm a supporter of the death penalty. And some people say, well, isn't that a contrast? And no, it's not. There's a very big difference between the innocent life of the unborn, that child in the woman's womb, and somebody who's committed a heinous crime. And the state has not only a right, but a duty to protect its citizens and reserve the death penalty for those heinous crimes, like what Nico Jen Jenkins did in Omaha. And it's appropriate in those circumstances, and the state needs to reserve that right, and as governor, I will fight to keep the death penalty. Senator Jansen. I too believe that life begins at conception and ends at natural death. Or natural death. Um, having four children, I can't imagine life without them. And, uh, and I will do everything I can to protect the rights of the unborn. When it comes to the death penalty, I have uh, supported uh, the death penalty for our most heinous of murders ever since I've, well, since I've been in the legislature. Uh, I always have, but I voted uh, every time. Uh, I was one of the uh, sponsors, co-sponsors co of a bill uh, that put lethal injection forward in Nebraska. We're still working through issues on that. Of course, the other side is pushing back on that. And, but I'll continue to work with that. When I see the stories, I've seen it firsthand when one of my good friends was a victim of one of these heinous crimes. I've seen children that are victims of these heinous crimes. Just recently in Omaha, we saw a 93-year-old lady, a victim of this crime. Heinous crime in Scott's Bluff, a paper girl abducted. These are real tragedies. I won't go into details about them, but there needs to be that ultimate price to pay, and we need to do a better job of making sure we can get that and actually enforce it in Nebraska. And as governor, um, I will do that. Senator McCoy. You know, I don't take any responsibility any more seriously than that of protecting the lives of, of unborn Nebraskans. You know, I've been endorsed twice by Nebraska Right to Life, and I take that endorsement seriously. That's why I've not only prioritized, but introduced and gotten passed and now signed into law a number of pieces of legislation. You know, we talked about Medicaid expansion. Uh, under Obamacare and the effects, uh, the negative effects of Obamacare in Nebraska. Well, three years ago, I made certain sure that no tax dollars from Nebraskans can go to pay for abortions under Obamacare. In my first year in the legislature, I prioritized uh, the bill that made sure that, that every woman uh, sees the ultrasound of their unborn child before they contemplate having an abortion. You know, those Nebraskans have no other advocates than those of us that stand up for them and protect their lives uh, as, as public officials. When it comes to the death penalty, I mentioned earlier, 
that I led the charge against Ernie Chambers trying to repeal the death penalty last year. And I worked with Speaker Flood to institute lethal injection. Those are the things that I stand up for as a senator. Very few of us lead the way and introduce and prioritize legislation when it comes to pro-life and standing up for the death penalty. That's what I believe sets me apart in this race. Senator Carlson. Well, I am and I have been unabashedly pro-life in every way. I've talked against abortion on the floor many times in my seven years in the legislature. I voted for pro-life bills that come along. In fact, I would say this, that regardless of what you do with it, an abortion is pure and simply the killing of an innocent child, period. And when you compare that to the death penalty, now I don't think the death penalty is um, very effective. It's supposed to be a deterrent, but by the time we carry something out, it's almost you've forgotten what it was about. But in the last 30-some years, we've carried out the death penalty three times in Nebraska, and during that period of time, there's been about 100,000 reported abortions. That's not right. We should support human life. Human life is precious. And uh, that's the way I will be as governor. And uh, I will still uphold the uh, freedom to have the death penalty, even though I don't really believe it's, it's effective. But I would not vote to do anything with it. Thank you. Mr. Hesburgh? Um, I support the death penalty. Um, abortion uh, Nebraska has some of the most restrictive laws in the country on abortion, um, restricting almost all abortions after 20 weeks. Um, I do not favor liberalizing that, but I, on the same hand, I do not believe that politicians need to be more involved in the decision that a woman must make about her pregnancy. I believe a woman needs some latitude to make that decision in consultation with her families and doctors. So I'm in favor of liberalizing the law, but I also don't think politicians get, need to get more involved in the decisions a woman and family have to make. Mr. Sloan. I am uh, unabashedly pro-life as well. Uh, will consistently protect the rights of the unborn. Um, you heard me talk a lot tonight that when I think about this campaign and what I'm trying to do, it's really about the next generation. It's, it's about the young people. Unlike the federal government, which would have us borrow from our children and, and make their future less bright, I think Nebraska has a real opportunity to, to create a future and for us to invest forward. These are the children, and, and I will protect unborn children in, in each and every way. Um, with respect to the death penalty, um, I tend to agree with Senator Carlson um, that while I'm for it, I'm not really pleased with how effective it has been. Um, crime and, and serious crime continues to be a problem in this state. And so we're going to have to be more consistent in the way we apply it, more efficiently in the way we apply the death penalty, and I will support the death penalty. And Mr. Foley? Thank you. You know, the state of Nebraska faces many challenges, economic development questions, taxation questions, budget issues, and so forth. There's one question we've got to get right, and that is the protection of unborn children. When I served in the Unicamel for six years, I carried five pro-life bills to the governor's desk. No senator since Roe vs. Wade has carried five pro-life bills successfully to the governor's desk. And Ernie Chambers and I went around and around and around on those bills. And he fought me tooth and nail. And I had to invoke cloture on him five times to get those bills to the governor's desk. And I'm very proud that we succeeded in doing that. And I want to compliment Senator McCoy and Senator Carlson because they have been stand-up guys on this question. It's a tough issue. And they have stood up on this. And I admire them for doing that. We've got to get this question right. And as a governor, I'm going to continue to be, as I have in the past, an advocate for the unborn child, and I'm not going to apologize to anyone for being that advocate. On the death penalty, it's time for some honesty. We are spending enormous sums of money trying to execute people under a failed 
death penalty system. It's not working. We're not executing these people. All we're doing is succeeding in spending a lot of taxpayer money, wasting it, trying to seek vengeance on people when we're not going to succeed. Now I'll go into the, uh, the final uh, two minutes then, and we'll start with Mr. Sloan. The, the question that I get continually is, so how do you differentiate yourself um, from this field um, in terms of this group, very distinguished group of folks? And, and first of all, let me say, some very distinguished legislators and very distinguished business people. Um, and you will never hear me during this campaign say anything bad personally about anyone at this table. Very qualified. The difference is really, there's a difference between being in the legislature and being the chief executive of the state. The real question is, who's going to bring the vision for the next 10 or 20 years in the state? Who's going to provide that kind of leadership? Who has the experience? Uh, both in terms of being able to bring a state together. Who can be credible in Omaha, Lincoln, and in the Panhandle? Who can be credible in Washington because they have that experience? Who can be credible internationally as we seek to open up markets because they have international experience? I think what I bring to the table is that executive experience, and that is the differentiator. It's not that one person is better than another person, or one person is more honest than another person. Um, it's all about executive leadership and vision. I'm running for one reason only, and that is to create a brighter future for our, the next generations of Nebraskans coming up, and to create economic development from one end of the state to the other, and connect this state in a way that it hasn't been connected for a long, long time. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. It's been a privilege for Leslie and I to be here, and I greatly appreciate you being here. Mr. Ricketts. Well, first of all, I'd like to say to everybody listening on the radio, man, if you've been listening to this whole thing, congratulations. It's been a long night, and I get to say something every now and then. So uh, thank you all to the audience for sticking around here tonight, too. We were taking bets early on who's going to be walking out there. For those of you on the radio audience who just joined, my name is Pete Ricketts, and I'm running for governor. And I'm running for governor because I love Nebraska. And I want to continue to make this state a place where people can live, work, and raise their families. And I'm running on the three things every governor ought to be running on. Improving educational outcomes for all of our kids, creating more and better paying jobs in each and every community throughout the state, and strengthening our rural economy and agriculture and manufacturing, because that is the backbone of our state's economy. And if you think about it, when you're voting for governor, you're voting for the chief executive of the state. And as the former chief operating officer of TD Ameritrade, I've had the experience of managing large budgets and organizations of setting spending priorities and making tough decisions. And those are the experiences and skills I bring to the table as governor. But I can't do it alone. I need your help. I'm asking for your support. If you like what you heard here tonight, please go to my website, www.peterricketts.com, or you can follow me on Twitter, like me on Facebook. Please join my campaign, and we can move Nebraska forward together. Thank you very much. Mr. Hesseberg. Well, I'm running for governor because I want to go to work, create good jobs, genuine opportunity for every Nebraskan in every community from the Missouri River in Omaha to the Sand Hills to the North Platte River and the Panhandle. Our state can only achieve its full potential if every Nebraskan in every community has the effort. Secondly, we need to develop our world-class wind resource in this state and in the process help revitalize rural Nebraska and reduce property taxes and improve landowner income. We're the Saudi Arabia of wind. Um, and for us not to develop our wind would be like Saudi Arabia or Texas not developing their oil. And by not doing it, I mean, we're way behind all of our neighboring states, even though we have the best wind. By not doing it, we're leaving thousands of good jobs on the table, many of them in our rural communities, and more to the point, we're leaving hundreds of millions of dollars in landowner income and property tax relief on the table by, by a failure of leadership in developing our world-class wind resource. I'm going to change that. Senator Jensen. Thank you, and thanks again to the sponsors.
My name is Charlie Jansen, and I want to be your next governor. I wouldn't be here otherwise. Well, I might. The burger was pretty good on the other end of town. Don't get me wrong, it's just a long way to drive for it. When you talk about picking your next leader, one thing I didn't get much of a chance to talk about is that I started my own company, and I had to mortgage my house to do it when I was 29 years old. I didn't take over for anybody. I started it. Obama did I did I got employees together. I used my bank account. And when you have your house on the line, that's real. And you have to make decisions that affect people's lives. Your employees. Proud to say, some 14 years later, that company twice has been named by Inc. Magazine. It's one of the 500 fastest growing companies in the United States. I've remained as president of the company while serving as a state senator. Now that will probably change when I, when I get down to Lincoln. But I want to say, one, I can certainly multitask. I can start a business from the ground up. I can also look critically at a problem and make the decision that's best for the business and sometimes understand that we have to make cuts. And we have to push back. As a state senator, I talked about how I push back. I push back on federal overreach. We talked about Second Amendment rights. I was pushing back against the federal government before it was politically convenient for everybody else to do so. Voter ID, please sign that petition tonight. It's my bill, it's still in the legislature. We, we the people have got to fight back. Because the main reason I'm running for governor is because you get down to Lincoln, people quit listening to their constituents. I can't believe some of the votes that I've seen that, that go forward when you talk about Medicaid expansion. I was shocked at some of the people that voted uh, against it. I was shocked at uh, even people from out in western Nebraska that would come down there and vote, and they vote against voter ID. They vote for Medicaid expansion. Thank you again. Uh, please vote for me. VoteJansen.com. Go ahead. You know, isn't tonight great? You know, it's, it's good to see all the kids in the audience and to have a, a, a packed house tonight a lot of people listen, a lot of Nebraskans listening on the radio. You know what's exciting to me is, is this is the way the campaign should be. Because there's a lot at stake here. It's our way of life. You know, we have a federal government that's run amok. And the only thing that stands in the way of that is a unicameral Nebraska that's willing to stick up for our state and a governor that's a tireless promoter and defender of the state of Nebraska. That's what I intend to be. You know, my name is Bo McCoy, and I've spent the last five years in the legislature trying to do everything I said I would do when I ran for the legislature twice, and that's cut taxes, control spending, create jobs, and provide the best quality education for Nebraskans. You know, I can't be uh, Governor Heineman. None of us can. You know, I imagine if he could run for another term, he'd get elected in a landslide. But you know what? No one has stood shoulder to shoulder more with Governor Heineman than I have. And I believe I'm the proven and tested conservative leader in this race. And I intend to lead as governor the same way I've led in the legislature, to not shy away from the big issues and to make the tough decisions that have to be made to move our state forward. And I need your support. Check us out at BoForGovernor.com on Facebook and Twitter because it's your help and support that matters across the state. You know, over 20,000 miles I've been in the PECA the last three and a half months to meet all of you. And that's the way these campaigns should be, for us to shake your hand, look in the eye, and ask for your support. And we've got big decisions to make in our state. And thanks for all of you for being here tonight. And Senator Carlson. Thank you tonight for your patience and for your attention. Each one of us likes to indicate why we should be the next governor. I've had extensive experience in the private sector, small business, the engine that moves in the Nebraska economy. I will have had 15 years experience in the public sector, eight in the state legislature and seven in a state university as a professor, football and baseball coach. I've demonstrated leadership been elected as chair of the Ag Committee. I've been elected as chair of the Natural Resources Committee. You don't get those positions by just saying you want them. Your colleagues have to elect you. 
I've demonstrated leadership. People tell me I have common sense. That's a good trait, and I think it's important that the governor have common sense. Faith is very important to me, and it's important to Margo. It will continue to be that when I'm governor of Nebraska. And by the things that have been stated tonight, and the concerns that you've registered, one thing is very clear. We have to have an improving economy going forward. We've got to have more private sector jobs. It takes 10 private sector jobs to fund one government position. That's a dangerous ratio. And you can slide downhill in a hurry. We've got to be careful about how we spend our money. We've got to spend it the right way. We've got to provide the services that are essential. We've got to have the ability and the will to say a service is no longer essential. Let's stop it. I'm willing to do that. I'm Tom Carlson. I want to be your next governor. I live in the 3rd Congressional District. I'm from rural Nebraska. I've been there most of my life. You have the opportunity to elect a governor who lives in the 3rd Congressional District. I want to be your governor. Together, we will make the good life even better. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carlson and, and all the rest of you. I can't tell you how much uh, I appreciate your moving on. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Cole. <laughs> I know, I know Senator uh, Davis is in a hurry to get home tonight, but I, I went like just a couple minutes. <laughs> you know, there, there is one uh, characteristic that I think you ought to consider when you make a decision as to who to vote for on May 13th for next governor. And it comes down to one word, and that's experience. I've got it. I've walked the talk. I've served the state as a state senator for six years. And I've fought the battles to defend human life. I've fought the battles to defend Second Amendment rights. Work against tax increases to build responsible state budgets. As I mentioned earlier, the only candidate in this race has actually served on the Appropriations Committee, which is the committee that does the heavy lifting in the legislature and writes that state budget. Beyond that, I'm now in my eighth year as your state auditor. Being the state auditor gives you a unique, very unique bird's eye view of the machinery of state government. It's enormously complex. I wish it were so simple that we could pull somebody out of the private sector and plunk them down as the chief executive officer of a $10 billion operation called Nebraska State Government. It's not that simple. This is a complex machine, and I've spent years studying it. I understand how it works, I understand where the weaknesses are, and I understand how those weaknesses can be addressed. Our health and human services system, a third of our state government, $3 billion agency, 5,600 employees, is a disgrace. And I've committed to the voters of the state. I'm going to get in that office as governor, and I'm going to take HHS apart. Not because I want to damage it, because I want to rebuild it. I'm going to take it apart brick by brick, and I'm going to rebuild it into an agency that serves vulnerable Nebraskans and does it in a way that respects the people who pay the bills, the taxpayers of Nebraska. Mike Foley for governor.com. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank you, Ms. Foley. I apologize for that. I looked back, and I had you up above Senator McCoy, and I skipped that slide. Very much apologize. Um, so as I was saying, I want to really thank these guys so much for coming out here. It was a big effort. I know that you appreciate that. And let's give them a big round of applause. We've got some refreshments back here that have been prepared, and I know they're delicious because I know the people that are back there doing the food work, and so enjoy that. Also, I want to recognize the uh, Future Farmers of America and their instructor, Lacey Everett, who's back here. They just recently won some big awards, and I forgot to mention that in my opening. And um, once again, I want to tell the candidates here that you guys drove a long way, but I know some of the folks out here have driven 125 or 130 miles to come see you. So they thought it was important. I think it was important. I appreciate coming to the 43rd District, and I wish all of you good luck. Thank you.